the COVID-19 Origin Act of 2023. The bill would require the Director of National Intelligence to declassify and make public within 90 days information on the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. In recent weeks, both the Department of Energy and the FBI have publicly stated that they believe the most likely scenario for the origins of COVID-19 is a laboratory leak. As members know, the Wuhan Institute of Virology was involved in so-called gain-of-function research on coronaviruses in Wuhan, China, which is where the COVID-19 uh, was first reported. It's neither a, a stretch of logic nor conspiracy theory to state that it's likely that the Department of Energy and the FBI's assessment is correct, and that a laboratory leak constitute the most likely scenario behind the emergence of COVID-19. S-619 will ensure that as much information as possible is declassified and made public to help the United States better prepare for future pandemic. The second bill we will consider is House uh, Joint Resolution 27, a resolution of disapproval under the Congressional Review Act, providing for the disapproval of the recent Waters of the United States rule. Uh, in January, the Army Corps of Engineers and Environmental Protection Agency issued a new rule to define the term waters of the United States as it is found in the Clean Water Act. Unfortunately, this definition is far too broad and is overly inclusive. If it is allowed to remain in effect, it will amount to the federal government asserting the right to regulate geographic features like wetlands, ditches, and ephemeral or intermittent streams. This will create significant regulatory burdens for small businesses, manufacturers, farmers and ranchers, and local communities across the country. It will have a particularly damaging effect in rural districts like the one I represent, which is why I'm proud to uh, have joined every member of the Oklahoma delegation in co-sponsoring this resolution. In passing H.J. Res 27, we will be providing regulatory certainty for Americans, reducing compliance costs, and ensuring that our federal water regulations comply with congressional intent. Our final item is H.R. 140, the Protecting Speech from Government Interference Act. In recent years, we've seen repeated instances of high-powered government officials in the executive branch using their official authority or influence to pressure content platforms like Twitter to suppress an otherwise lawful speech. H.R. 140 would put an end to this practice and will ensure that no government official engages in tacit or explicit censorship uh, or other suppression of unlawful speech, of lawful speech, excuse me. The free speech is guaranteed under the First Amendment to the Constitution. In taking up H.R. 140, we're ensuring that the federal government will always adhere to that right and to ensure that freedom of speech remains a key principle governing our democracy. I now yield to my good friend, our ranking member, Mr. McGovern, for any remarks he wishes to make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, as you mentioned, today we'll consider three measures. First is S-619, the COVID-19 Origin Act. Look, the American people, and in fact, the international community, deserve to know how COVID originated. And shortly after President Biden took office, he told the U.S. intelligence community to answer that question. He said that, uh, quote, critical information about the origins of this pandemic exists in the People's Republic of China. Yet from the beginning, government officials in China have worked to prevent international investigators and members of the global public health community from assessing it, end quote. The intelligence community continues to gather data in search of answers. They have now released a public report. That report is inconclusive. Members of Congress can view the classified version of the report. But the bottom line is that we don't know for sure, and we need to keep investigating. I'd also like to point out that the House Intelligence Committee is having a markup on a House version of this bill later today. Um, it would be great if we could have markups on bills before they come to this committee, which is supposed to be the last stop before the floor. Perhaps there will be important discussions about the bill that would have made it better or identified flaws. We won't know because the markup is happening later this afternoon. In any event, we have uh, H.G. Res 27, a Congressional Review Act that would roll back efforts to protect rivers, streams, and wetlands across America. Three weeks ago, a train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, dumped dangerous chemicals into local water. The Trump administration got rid of rules about better brakes on trains carrying flammable materials, ended regular rail safety audits of railroads, 
and put chemical industry lobbyists in charge of the EPA office overseeing chemical safety. And now, Republican leadership is advancing a bill so the very polluters they deregulated can get out of paying to clean up the toxic messes they've made. I think we should rename this the Polluter Protection Act. It recklessly ties the hands of federal agencies that want to protect our nation's water at a time when we should be doing uh, the opposite. Finally, we have H.R. 140, the Protecting Speech from Government Interference Act. We could focus on literally anything. Uh, we could be focusing on inflation, food costs, climate change, health care access, issues that affect the daily lives of Americans. But here we are today focused on Twitter. Uh, my Republican colleagues claim that this bill is about free speech. Give me a break. Let's back up a second and just kind of review the Republican record on free speech. 25 states, all with Republican lawmakers in charge, have passed 64 laws prohibiting students from learning about certain things in school. Republican-led states have banned over 1,000 books in schools. A Republican lawmaker in, ten in the Tennessee House wants to burn the books instead of just banning them. And so when it comes to censorship, the Republican Party may want to start looking in the mirror. In fact, I've submitted, a, submitted an amendment to ensure that nothing in this act will prohibit a federal employee from advocating against the banning of books, specifically books on topics such as communities of color, the history of slavery and racism in the United States, and books with LGBTQI characters. This bill is based on a totally false premise that the government pressured Twitter to take down news stories. Even though the GOP's own witnesses at their oversight hearing said that's not what happened, but who cares about the facts? And now, in pursuit of their disproven claims, the majority seeks to redefine the First Amendment in pursuit of their own political agenda. Look, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, 73% of Americans, nearly three of four people, uh, say that the Republican majority in the House is not focusing on the right issues. Instead of working on things that matter to most people, like lowering costs, helping families, and supporting workers, we are wasting time on nonsense like this. And you know who loses out the most on all of these wasted opportunities? The American people. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Without objection, any prepared statements that our witnesses may have will be included in the record. I'd like to welcome our first panel, Chairman Turner and Ranking Member Himes, uh, to the witness table. Chairman Turner, I welcome your testimony. Chairman Cole, Ranking Member Govern, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for having us here today and for inviting us to testify on uh, Senate Bill 619. I'm uh, proud to be here with my ranking member, uh, Jim Himes. We are your new Intelligence Committee. Uh, we won't always agree on everything, but we are committed uh, to working together in a bipartisan and professional manner. Uh, Senate uh, 619 is a bill that would require the Director of National Intelligence to declassify information relating to the origins of COVID-19. This is a bill that passed the Senate on unanimous consent. Mr. Chairman, the COVID-19 pandemic wrecked havoc across the country, with almost every household feeling its effects. The United States' death toll from the virus has surpassed one million people. Although concrete data is hard to lock down, millions of Americans are suffering from the long-term effects directly attributed to the virus. COVID-19 has also negatively affected our communities, especially our kids. It is becoming increasingly clear that school-aged children face major educational hurdles because of distance learning and long-term school closures. The American public deserves answers to every aspect of the COVID-19 pandemic, including how this virus was created, and specifically whether it was a natural occurrence or was the result of a lab-related event. Mr. Chairman, the House Intelligence Committee, which oversees our intelligence community, is aware of classified information that would help inform the public as to why the FBI director has indicated that a COVID-19 lab leak is not just a possibility, but approaches the idea that it is likely. The intelligence community does have more information about COVID-19 than the public has seen. Much of the information the intelligence community has can be declassified and disseminated to the public. In fact, the bill we are discussing today would give the American public just a glimpse, albeit a very important aspect of the classified information that tell the intelligence community holds. Senate 619, if passed by the House and signed into law, would give the American public a unique insight as to what was happening at biosafety <laughs> level laboratory in Wuhan, China in late 2019 and early 2020. The laboratory and who was working there might be the key to unraveling the truth. 
With those concerned about declassifying COVID-19 origins information, I can assure you that the intelligence community could release its information while protecting their sources and methods of how it was collected. In fact, Senate 619 explicitly authorizes the Director of National Intelligence to make such redactions necessary to protect sources and methods. COVID-19 ranks as this century's most important event. No community was spared and every corner of the world felt its effects. Everyone deserves to know what our intelligence community knows and Senate 619 is a step in the right direction. Uh, we do expect, as Ranking Member McGovern has noted, uh, that we will be passing a House version of this bill out on a bipartisan basis today. Uh, with that, I am happy to answer any questions that you have and to yield to my Ranking Member. Chairman Cole, Ranking Member McGovern, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to share my views on S-619. I plan to support this legislation both in committee where we will mark up a companion bill this evening and in the full House later this week. Determining the precise origins of a pandemic disease is challenging under the best of circumstances, but because COVID originated in China, the efforts to definitively determine its source have been even more difficult. At every juncture, the PRC government has obfuscated and obstructed legitimate inquiries a deeply irresponsible approach to global health, public health. In 2021, in 2021, President Biden ordered a 90-day sprint by the intelligence community to analyze the origins of the virus. Because of both technical analysis and access to clandestine intelligence, the IC is uniquely positioned to answer those questions if they can be answered. In August of 2021, the IC completed its initial work, and in October, a declassified version of the findings were made public. In short, despite major efforts, most IC agencies judged that there was simply not enough information to make a judgment about the likelihood of how and where the virus originated. Some agencies did reach a judgment about which path was more likely, but they could not do so with high confidence, and that remains true today. All members can review the classified assessment through the House Security Office, which explains in much greater detail the basis for the IC's analysis. Around 18 months after the completion of the first IC assignment, not much has changed. Chairman Turner and I can both attest that the IC remains focused on the question. The COVID-19 Origins Act is not the bill I would have necessarily drafted on the topic, but I support it because I share the belief that the intelligence community should continue to get to the bottom of COVID's origin. And importantly, I believe that they should make as much public as they can so the American people can consider the best available information we have as opposed to marinating in conjecture and speculation and conspiracy theories. Taking a step back, whether COVID-19 originated from a lab leak or natural transmission, the next pandemic disease could originate from either source. In 2022, the House Intelligence Committee released a declassified report looking at how the IC responded to COVID-19 and making recommendations for how we can be better prepared for the next pandemic disease, wherever it may come from. Even as the IC looks backwards to 2019 and the first days of the pandemic, we need to keep looking forward to how we can be ready for the next one. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, thank you again for the opportunity to testify and happy with the Chairman to take any of your questions. And I thank you both for uh for being here today. Uh, I'll start with myself and Mr. Cole's absence. And uh, I did see the uh, Sunday morning news show where, where you were interviewed on this topic. Uh, you both did very well. But I got the impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the at the president's direction, there was a, an evaluation done in the intelligence community but that part that was made public was very different from that part, which is still classified. Did, did I understand that correctly? Um, it, it, they don't contradict each other, uh, but, but it's really the, um, the sense that you get from reading them that I, I think doesn't follow. When I read the classified report and then I read the declassified, the unclassified report, um, there were conclusions that were in the classified report that were not accurately, in my opinion, reflected in the unclassified version. Um, as the, um, the minority last year, uh, we issued a report on the bottom page six, top page seven, we go into uh, the difference. And largely it goes to the fact that in the unclassified version, they began to eliminate the, whether they had low confidence, medium confidence, or high confidence, which was very evident and clear in the first report. Um, and that contrast, I think, misleads someone. So, Mr. Himes, let me, uh, I'll, I'll take you at your word that the, any member 
will have the ability to review the classified? Because I, I have not. I have asked and have not been allowed to do that. But that is that now a possibility? That that's, that's correct. If a, if a request is made by any member of Congress to review classified information, the typical procedure is for the, the, the Intelligence Committee to vote on that request. To my memory, it is almost always agreed to, and that member can then come down and review whatever he or she seeks. Unfortunately, that has not been my experience. Now, I will just say Department of Energy, uh, so his answer is, and my answer is yes. Oh, very well. You, you can you can expect the request uh, yes. <laughs> at the conclusion at the gavel of this uh, at the gavel of this hearing, but uh, the. Uh, the defense, no, I'm sorry, the, the Energy Department's intelligence figure who quoted that there was a lab leak responsible for this. And then uh, as a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, I've not been able to get access to that report that the Department of Energy has, uh, has produced. And the reason that becomes important is shortly after that, the head of the FBI was interviewed on a television program where he acknowledged that a lab leak was the most likely source. So you can understand people's frustration with this, and that's why I think it's so important to get as much information out to the public as we possibly can. Um, when the coronavirus first hit three years ago, comments were made about how China was extremely forthcoming with information. They they, they, they came forward, gave the genetic sequence, and it was a, a vastly different China than the one that had held information away from the public after the first SARS outbreak in, in 2003. Were those, were those statements incorrect? Was China forthcoming? So first off, no, they were not. Um, but you, you are referring, I think, to the initial period where there may have been individuals who um, had uh, were not yet working in coordination with the, the Chinese government, where there was information that was shared. But no, they have not been forthcoming. Uh, they've, they've actually been um, thwarting the, the efforts for not only the United States, but others uh, to, to find the information of what was happening in China. And this is so important. I mean, when then China moves into its zero COVID episode that it just emerged from, I mean, you've got you got to ask yourself, what do they know now <laughs> that they're not sharing with us? Because three years ago, they knew some stuff and weren't sharing with us, and it all turned out to be really, really bad. So, it, I, again, I just can't stress how important it is to get the information out there to the public, let people make their own assessments on this. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, in May of, of 2021, I was promised by the then chairman of the Oversight and Investigations Subcommittee in Energy and Commerce that the committee, Energy and Commerce Committee, would have a hearing into the origins of COVID and try to get from the Chinese what they knew. But then that never happened. It just sort of went into the uh, went into the round file. And I, uh, I do have the uh, transcript of that hearing, and I will be submitting that for the record without objection so ordered. Uh, feels very powerful to be able to say that, Mr. Ranking Member. But I, I, I really want to thank both of you for being here. I'm just ask you an open-ended question. Is there any reason why we wouldn't want to make this information public now? I, I don't think so. I, 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 neither one of us would sit in front of you and suggest this. And certainly the Senate, who has individuals who have equal access to, to classified information, would not have passed by unanimous consent if this information would be damaging to us. And, and in addition, the, the bill that is before you has the provision that if the director of ODI and I determines that any of the information is of concern, that they have the ability to redact it. Yeah, I agree with the chairman, uh, Mr. Burgess. And, and, and I actually think there's, uh, there, there is protection against the revelation of sources and methods. I also think this will be actually really good education for, for my colleagues, because when they have an opportunity to look at this information, they're going to see what the chairman and I have now seen, which is, there's just not much conviction at all on the part of any of the 17 elements of the intelligence community, 
not because these aren't very competent agencies, but because the information from China simply has not been forthcoming. So it's not going to be enormously revelatory for our colleagues to see this information, but it's really important that they understand what we do know. Well, and, and again, just underscoring, it is so important that we do know. And as I think, Mr. Turner, you referenced, there could be a there could be a next time, and we do need to be prepared for whatever might be uh, what might be ahead. Um, I'll yield to the uh, ranking member of the Rules Committee, Mr. McGovern. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, at, I, um, I, mean, I think we all there's no reason not to support this bill. We all want to get to the to the bottom of this. We all want to know the truth and. I think it's important that, as Dr. Burgess pointed out, uh, to say that China has not been forthcoming in the beginning. We had a, a, the previous occupant of the White House assured us early on that China was cooperating. It was forthcoming. It turned out not to be true. But look, uh, I, this is just a technical question. I mean, I'm a big proponent of regular order, hearing, markup, rule, and floor. Uh, so I commend you for at least holding a markup later today. But I would maybe call this irregular order because um, you are supposed to mark it up before you come here. Um, and um, why is this being done backwards? I mean, are we, are we going to have two votes? Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why we're doing it, because it's, you know, it could be perfunctory as to why is our committee marking up a bill that came out of the Senate un unanimous consent and is headed here, is because we wanted to make the statement as the committee that with the exact same text, text and, and obviously with access to the information that this bill is about, that we support the bill. Uh, it was really our only way to do that, um, to give the House confidence that those who have access to the information uh, see that um, the Senate bill is was one that can be supported. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just a little, I, I don't know why a, a unanimous vote or near unanimous vote on the House floor wouldn't do the same thing. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, so I assume that you're not going to change much of the no, bill. the one that's coming to the floor is the Senate version. Our House version, which will pass our committee which today, mark up later, bipartisan, yeah. is is the exact same text, and it will right. Um, right. Yeah. And most likely, my understanding, will be passing uh, on a bipartisan basis. So we're not going to be voting twice on the same bill. You will not. Okay. All right. Well, in any event, I mean, I, I think look, I, I think everybody wants to get to the truth uh, into the and to find out what really happened here, uh, and um, and I think as much as it can be declassified in a responsible way so the American people can see uh, what the reality is and the truth is, I think is, is, uh, is a useful uh, pursuit. So um, in any event, I will support this when it comes to the floor. And thank you. I yield back. Chair, sure, thanks. The gentleman, gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Chairman Turner, uh, we, would you like to talk about just how damaging it was that the lab leak theory was pushed, I'm sorry, was t said that that was a conspiracy theory and that was that banned early on and that the mainstream media and the Democratic Party ran with this conspiracy theory that there was a leak at the la um, the wet market. Could you just talk about the damage to national security that that created? You know, the <clears throat> it, it's good when we have a full debate, right? And, and all opposing information is, is reviewed, even if it's scientific information, it should be subject to the same process of, um, of being challenged and then in conclusion. But the, the issue that we have in most of, of these type of topics where it involves another nation is they're listening too. Uh, and so while we're trying to come to conclusion as to what is the source, and they're getting sort of free ride, if you will, from a suppression of debate, it's not helpful. What about the fact that you had the World Health Organization basically parroting talking points from the Chinese Communist Party saying that COVID originated in a wet market? I mean, they basically were ignoring the evidence that was presented to them. By the way, by the Taiwanese, the Taiwanese who the Chinese will not allow in the World Health Organization. But would you like to talk about the suppression of that information? And maybe also the sidelining of the Taiwanese uh, by the World Health Organization? Yeah, you know, I, we're certainly committed. To, to world organizations by which we can all come together and, and take up topics that, that are worldwide. Certainly the United Nations, the World Health Organization. In all of those, though, um, the fact that these other countries who might be the source of an issue, like Russia and Ukraine, um, or China and, and the uh, COVID virus, um, they, it does affect the debate that they're present. That's why it's so important that the United States, which is an open society, have that debate, exchange that information, and look to science. <clears throat> Would you be willing to talk about how the Chinese Communist Party actually destroyed evidence and would not allow 
uh, Americans or other Westerners to have access to the BSL-4 lab right after COVID? And maybe talk about what that would indicate to you. At this point, the one thing I, I can talk about is, is certainly that they're not forthcoming um, and that they thwarted our opportunities to, to have direct access uh, and that, that, that certainly impeded our ability to bring in scientists, virologists, those individuals who would have an understanding of the, the information they're looking at. Um, and, but I do think that we do have other sources and methods that, that are continuing to be pursued that can help us inform this process and, and come to a conclusion. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. You know, it, to me, it just seems like we should have been doing this at the beginning of the, of the pandemic. And if you looked at it, so I was, I was shadow banned by Facebook and Twitter. I'm not sure if you know that. I came out actually two days ahead of Senator Cotton saying that this virus originated in a lab. And I did it because I was on the China Task Force. We received a briefing. And if you just look at the evidence, it was overwhelming that this originated in a lab. I mean, if you were to believe the wet market theory, <clears throat> which I think is a conspiracy theory, you would have to believe that a bat a thousand miles away from Wuhan miraculously traveled a thousand miles. By the way, when it was traveling, did not infect any other animals along the way, ended up in Wuhan. Then the virus jumped to 20%, I'm sorry, 20 times more lethal then the state of nature with a perfect S protein is, I know you know what I'm talking about, <clears throat> the S protein. And there was a BSL-4 lab in Wuhan that was being run by the PLA and the general in charge of their bioweapons program with an expert that specialized in zoonotic diseases, specifically bat-borne respiratory viruses. I, mean, I could prosecute that case all day, win every day of the week, twice on Sunday. Would you just like to talk about the overwhelming evidence that this did originate in a lab and not the, not, the, not the theory that it was in the wet market? I know we've talked about some of it, but like specifically the overwhelming evidence that this came from a lab. Right, so at this point, I, I think we have to wait for the declassification of, of some of the information that this bill would, would relate to to have a full conversation about that. I can respect that, especially given uh, the chairmanship that you have. On a, on a lighter note, I want to just welcome my uh, political science professor, Dr. Spiel. Uh, my colleagues across the aisle can blame, Dr. S can blame me on Dr. Spiel because that's the guy that taught me politics. Uh, in the back, I got nothing but respect for him, and he's uh, with students from my alma mater, so they're, they're here to, uh, I told them they got to come into the rules committee because it's the committee that, uh, you know, it's the real committee in Congress. Let's just put it that way. So I just wanted, just wanted to welcome Dr. Spiel and the political science students from Penn State Erie, the Barron College. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks, and gentlemen. <clears throat> Dr. Steel, you are forgiven. Um, <laughs> recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Like no, we'll, 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 we'll Chairman McGovern. Thank you. And I, too, want to welcome the students from Penn State. I represent eastern portion, so uh, good to see you. And you know, there is some balance in the state here. Um, I, I would yield to the ranking member. You know, um, I just I just want to um, respond to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. I mean, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Donald Trump was president, and I just want to ask unanimous consent to insert into the record. An article that appeared in Politico says 15 times Trump praised China as coronavirus was spreading, spreading across the globe. The president has lambasted the WHO for accepting Beijing's assurances about the outbreak, but he repeated them as well. Uh, and I just, I think it's important for the record to be uh, accurate. Um, and with that, uh, I thank the general lady for yielding. And was there anything you wanted to add, Mr. Himes? You're good. No, I, I um, uh, very much appreciate the bipartisan support. I, I do think that the underlying idea of getting as much information into the hands of the American public is absolutely the right thing to do right now. Again, I've now heard the word conspiracy theory brought up a whole bunch of times. Let's let, we're a democracy, let's let Americans look at the information and form their own judgments. So, um, thank you. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Chair Rankin is a gentlelady from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I appreciate the bipartisan support and I think that this is, um, it's about transparency because during, you know, one of the things that COVID did, 
did to us is the distrust of government, I think. And, and I think this is a step in the right direction of that transparency. And I, and I won't take any more time, but I fully support the bill. And I'm very glad that we are moving forward with this and the Senate has moved it. We need to make sure that the public has the information that, uh, that we have. So thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you, Chair Rankin, as a gentlelady from New Mexico. Thank you, Chairman, and I really appreciate having a bipartisan bill for both the chair and ranking are coming before us. I think it's the first one I've participated since I've been on rules, and I do appreciate the fact that there has been such good work uh, by the Biden administration on trying to find out where this started and then agree that in order to uh, combat disinformation and to make sure that everybody knows that we uh, uh, that we go ahead and, and, and allow the American public to see this information. And so with that, I yield back. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen from Kentucky is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A um, few quick questions. Can't the, Mr. Himes, can't the president do this himself? Can't he just declassify this stuff and release it all? So why do we have to do this? Why can't we just make a call over there and Mr. Turner and, and say, Mr. President, why don't you just release this for the good of the people? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Massey. Um, the, um, I, in all of this, um, there, we have to be concerned of getting information out so the public knows, right? We also have to look at the, um, the current uh, conflicts that are occurring between the United States and China. And by our doing this, we're helping the president because the president both has the ability to do this on his own, and he also has the ability to veto our bill. But getting our bill, he has full <laughs> endorsement. And as I would have said to Mr. McGovern when he was asking me about you know, why are we marking this up and then sending it to the floor of the Senate bill, this is momentum. This is giving the president an understanding that he has bipartisan and bicameral support to take this action. And anybody who criticizes him, he can, he can cite that support. Do um, do we think this is, I mean, in the Senate, it passed with a veto-proof majority. Will, Unanimous consent. So he's not really going to have much of a choice. I, mean, I, I I'm sympathetic to your argument. That makes sense. It's the first one that's made sense to me on why, he can't just, why he's not just doing it himself. Um, I, I, but I, I he really that as an accomplishment, being the first time testifying before you in your new position on rule. <laughs> the first, I like your very first answer. Um, but, it, I mean, how do, maybe it's uh, early to anticipate how this would go here in the House, but it sounds like we may also achieve a veto-proof majority here. And I wouldn't be so concerned about, about a veto as much as, as sending to the president full support, bipartisan, bicameral, for him to take this action. Uh, and then I think certainly with that, especially with the, the caveat that we're giving full acknowledgement that they can redact ideas and information that they think uh, would put uh, our intelligence community at risk. Okay, let me play devil's advocate here. Why did we withhold our support and help for the president for two years? Like, why did it take us this long to do this bill? Well, I mean, a couple of things that you do have to take into consideration, but I think the biggest one that I would cite is it does take the Senate longer to do things. So. I think it's good that this came from the Senate because certainly the House has debated and looked at doing this. They got it done before your committee, the though. Fact, the, <laughs> the fact that they have, have done this uh, gives us really the ability to know that we're not doing a meaningless task. Um, I s support this bill, um, and I'm glad we're doing a, a rule for it. Uh, it's my understanding that w we are leaving out amendments or we're, we're not going to have amendments on this because we, in the it, well, first of all, it's a short bill. It doesn't, probably doesn't need any amendments, and, I, and this will be decided later, but it seems to me that there's the, uh, the inclination not to amend this Senate. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, but this button, it's, it's, the goal is to get this on the president's desk, and obviously if there were any amendments, it would have to come back to the Senate, and then we don't know what the Senate would do. Uh, we have this bill that has come out with unanimous consent, and so moving it is, is most expeditious. Thank you. Um, and if the gentleman would be yeah, Mr. Chairman. not wishing to uh, uh, interrupt the momentum going forward here, but no amendments have been filed. Okay. Well, that makes it easy. We don't have to be the bad guys, right? 
Um, I am I'm excited that this bill is going to pass and it's going to go to the president's desk. And I'm, and I'm hopeful I, for a veto-proof majority, not that I think he would veto it. I haven't seen a statement from the White House opposing it, as we've seen on so much of our um, legislation already this year. And one of the things I'm excited about is there's a whole list, just to go a little bit afield of the particular direction of this bill, there's a whole list of things that were conspiracy theories they are going to have to be acknowledged. And this is the first of many in a list. Uh, and I think there's probably information at the government, somewhere in the executive branch, there's certainly uh, a lot of history to show that a lot of the things that were called conspiracy theories are, in fact, true and that the administration knew about it, either and not to pick on Biden. I think also under Trump, he probably had advisors who knew, for instance, that natural immunity is real. This is, this is one of the things that's been put out there as a myth We've uh, since the very beginning of COVID. In fact, a lot of people acknowledge natural immunity right up until the day we had a vaccine. And uh, there were a lot of reasonable strategies that people could uh, take care of other people without running much risk of getting seriously ill if they had already recovered from the vaccine. I mean, that was, by the way, and uh, before anybody says, oh, this is Congressman Massey again saying everybody should run out and get infected. That was never, natural immunity is not a strategy. Natural immunity is a biological fact. And we need to, should have incorporated it. Going forward, we need to incorporate it. We still have vaccine mandates in this country that don't make sense. Thankfully, we passed H.R. 185 a few weeks ago. But once you understand that natural immunity is a thing, having a vaccine mandate, setting aside the morality and the ethics of forcing somebody to take a medical treatment, uh, if you really wanted to mandate immunity, you would recognize not just vaccinated immunity, but natural immunity. So that's, I mean, I, there's a whole list of things that were conspiracy theories that finally... I think everybody's starting to acknowledge, for instance, that masks never really did prevent COVID transmission, that school closures never really s slowed down the spread of this virus, um, that young people need a vaccine booster. These are all, by the way, I'm calling these myths. Um, and so does uh, a doctor from John Hopkins, Marty uh, Macri. Thank you for helping me with the pronunciation there. Um, and, and on his list is COVID, origina COVID originating from the Wuhan lab is a conspiracy theory. Obviously, it's not a conspiracy theory. We're going to find out more about that. Uh, a whole long list of these. I won't go on. I know we've got a lot of other bills to cover, and I appreciate the, the chairman and the ranking member's time. Uh, and thank you for bringing this bill. And I yield back. Chair, thanks. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And um, This has been long overdue. As Thomas, uh, Congressman Massey mentioned, you know, the, the sad part about it is why this president has led the way on this. When you look at his responses, um, on September 20th, uh, September in 2020, um, the day after the travel restrictions were put in place, Biden criticized Trump for his xenophobic response to the coronavirus. February 2023, no consensus on the lab leak by the press secretary. March 2023, he abrupt, Biden abrupt, abruptly bails on reporters when asked about the COVID origins. Questions like, very hard questions, will you hold China accountable? Uh, he threw up his hands and he walked away. What this is doing to the public is really eroding the, any type of trust in, the, in, in, uh, in government uh, and our tax dollars are paying the, paying the price for this. So um, thank you all for bringing it forward. It's long overdue. Should have been here long before now. And as you know, the president could easily do this as he can easily do, uh, lift other, um, other informative things on January 6th, which he just will not do. But thank you for bringing it. I'm glad it is bipartisan and uh, probably one of the few, but this one is. I think it's a good thing. I yield back. Sure. Thanks, the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Roy of Texas recognized. 
I, I thank the chairman. Uh, I thank you guys for uh, for being here. Um, uh, just a couple of quick questions um, to the chairman. Uh, am, am I not correct that there was a, a good deal of dismissal of the um, questions that some of our colleagues and, and, and were raising in 2020 and 2021, when some of our colleagues were raising questions about the origin, that there was a pretty significant amount of dismissal both by some of our other colleagues, but importantly in the press. For example, February 2020 New York Times article said of the, the, uh, the weight of this type of information being in the public discourse, I think does help us all go forward. And, and I think it illuminates the path for what the administration and the intelligence community needs to do to get us even more definitive information as to the source and the origins of COVID. Uh, any other, any thoughts to add to that or? No. Oh, okay, okay. Um, it, you know, the, the, the only thing I would add to that uh, um, in terms of the, uh, I appreciate the point about saying there's no like smoking gun. Um, I, and I don't doubt that at all. I, th I think my primary concern is that we, at least as a body, I, this is a good step. But again, in the seek truth wherever it may lead vein, um, I, I don't, I mean, I can't say with certainty, right? I mean, I, but, but what bothers me is the extent to which there was such rapid and immediate dismissal uh, of the possibility. And, and remember, it, it was labeled as being, you know, uh, you know xenophobic, anti-Chinese, right? That it was, it was somehow connected to and leading to violence here in the United States and that these things were, you know, it was off, you know, uh, you, you literally just couldn't go touch the topic of whether or not it originated in China because somehow that would be, I don't know, racist or something to say that we can't go inquire as to whether or not this thing started in China. And, uh, or, or, and if it did start in China, whether it was through the markets or in a lab. And I, I do think this is important, and again, We'll see what's in it. Um, you guys have seen it, and so we'll, we'll look and, and see. I, I would like to include in the record a uh, letter that uh, I and 13 of my colleagues sent to Speaker Pelosi on September 14th, 2021, uh, seeking question, uh, uh, answers to questions surrounding the origins of COVID-19, specifically questions involving EcoHealth Alliance uh, and some of the information that we know that the NIAID knew at the time and was, uh, was met with crickets from the then uh, Speaker of the House. And I would just ask uh, uh, consent to insert that in the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, so ordered. Um, and, you know, in, in broad terms, I would just say that, you know, I, I would note that the um, uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee report la in August of 21, that same year, like a month or two before we sent that letter to the Speaker, um, concluded Quote, it's an opinion of the committee minority staff based on the preponderance available information, the documented uh, efforts to obfuscate, hide, and destroy evidence, and the lack of physical evidence to the contrary that SARS-CoV-2 was accidentally released from Wuhan Institute of Virality Laboratory sometime prior to September 12, 2019. I don't know if they're right. That's just colleagues in the minority in the uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee. I have no idea if they're right. But that was in August of 21, and I recall you know, the reactions of saying that that was, you know, politically motivated, um, as opposed to trying to lay out alternative theories contrary to where the, the media was taking this this whole question. Uh, but with that, I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, gentlelady from Indiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Turner, thank you for um, being here today uh, before the Rules Committee. Uh, is this the first time we've had you up here? I've personally been here before, but not as chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I was glad to see this bill come over from the Senate in a unanimous way. Uh, we certainly take all classified information seriously, so I was hoping you could expound on what this legislation would do from a technical perspective. As far as declassifying information, I don't want this to be dis, uh, misconstrued. We are uh, concerned with protecting sources and methods. Um, all this legislation says is that the American people have a right to know the origins of COVID-19 given its serious impacts on our lives. Um, is that a fair statement, Mr. Chairman? Sure, so as we all recall, um, the, uh, the president indicated uh, in his first year that he tasked the intelligence community uh, to review all of the information that they currently had 
uh, and to issue a report within 90 days of the, the status of the investigation on COVID-19 and the conclusions and information that, uh, that could be derived uh, from the, the data that the Intelligence Committee had. And, and also in that time period, if there were any other things to follow up on, it included the ability, of course, for them to initiate new inquiries. But it was not necessarily expected that it was going to be in itself a full-blown investigation, an investigation really of what, what they knew and presented in a manner where it was a usable document uh, instead of it being you know, 18 different intelligence community agencies, but a, a document that presented the assessments of the community as, as a whole. Uh, that document had both a classified and a declassified version. The declassified version was made very widely public. Uh, the classified version then is what we're dealing with today. And it has not, uh, since it was uh, sent to the intelligence committees, uh, widely disseminated, and that is what we're calling for declassification. And widely disseminating the information is part of a critical effort to prevent uh, a, a pandemic of its kind from, from hitting us again in the future. Right, absolutely. But the review of this is, is not just, um, you know, trying to put a bullseye on, on the map as to location and, and source. It is to, to do a, a review of how anything like this could have happened. Um, and if it is avoidable in the future, and if there are things that need to be done, how, how do we approach that and what do we do? And declassifying this information is, is, is important in the overall awareness of the American people on prevention in the future, as well as other countries that would work together with us to prevent it in the future. We have the, the chairman and the ranking member of the Intelligence Community Committee who has seen the work of the intelligence community, and it is both our opinions that it would be helpful. Yeah. And then finally, thank you. <clears throat> One additional question. Um, my understanding is that similar legislation did pass the Senate last Congress, but was blocked for, from consideration uh, by the previous House majority. Can you think of any reason why the American people should not have an understanding of what their government knows um, about this matter that would protect public safety? I'm unaware of the procedure that you just discussed, but the, the um, I, I can tell you this. Um, after we take action, this will be bipartisan and bicameral and a very strong statement, which is very important. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Chairman Turner. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. I think the gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and <clears throat> thank you, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, for coming here in, in a spirit of bipartisanship. And you know, I just want to reiterate that at the height of the pandemic, that anyone who spoke out suggesting that COVID-19 might have come from a lab leak in China, they were denounced as a conspiracy theorist, a spreader of misinformation. They were canceled. They were shadow banned on social media platforms. Accounts were suspended. People's reputations were, were damaged and destroyed. Now, fast forward to today, we have the Department of Energy and the FBI both publicly reporting that their conclusions are that COVID-19 emerged as a result of a lab leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology a research institute in Wuhan, China, controlled by the People's Republic of China and ultimately the CCP. Uh, and, and coincidentally, it has been uncovered that Dr. Fauci commissioned a and had final approval on a scientific paper to disprove the theory that the virus leaked from the Wuhan lab in the very earliest days of this pandemic. And then cited that same uh, paper that he commissioned and had final approval of as if he did not. Uh, in many uh, you know, media outlets, press conferences, when the American people were scraping for answers. Um, I think it's easy to say that the American people are fed up with the smoke and mirror show that Washington bureaucracy and, and the administration has performed over these past few years while denouncing those who dare to offer a different view based on real evidence. This legislation is long overdue. Americans deserve to know as much as possible. And when I say that, I think of the nurses in my district who've lost their jobs due to the subsequent vaccine mandates, or the family members of the senior citizens who died in New York State's disastrous nursing home policies. They deserve to know the truth, and I thank you for bringing this bill forward so that the American people can get the answers that they deserve, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Are there any other questions for our panel? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for your participation today, and our witnesses are excused.
Okay, I'd like to welcome our second panel, not currently complete, but uh, uh, I would uh, recommend we go ahead and listen to the testimony from the ranking member, Mr. Larson, so I would welcome your testimony. Back, should I, start, should I start over, Mr. Chair? Okay, great. In fact, just last month, the EPA announced that $2.2 billion in BIL funding is now available to states, tribes, and territories to help our communities upgrade essential wastewater and stormwater infrastructure, including dollars in my, home, my own state. Nearly half of the funding is provided as grants or loans forgiveness to help underserved and rural communities across the country invest in clean water. The BIL showed what Congress is capable of, of when focused on addressing the real needs of American families. Unfortunately, rather than helping communities, the Congressional Review Act resolution before us today will weaken the historic federal-state partnership uh, that for over 50 years has worked to protect water quality across the country. I believe we all want clean water for our communities, for our farmers, for our water-dependent businesses, and for the protection of our environment. My constituents, like many of yours, know that rivers, streams, and wetlands are intrinsically connected. That's why I believe the health of our waters and our water-related economy is dependent on a strong partnership with the federal government and a level playing field among our upstream and downstream neighbors, including tribal lands. That was the prevailing bipartisan view which drove Congress to enact the original Clean Water Act over 50 years ago. Yet, this shared commitment to clean water has been replaced by efforts such as this resolution of disapproval to weaken the partnership to protect clean water while also creating unnecessary confusion and uncertainty. I do not support this WOTUS CRA, Waters of the U.S. Congressional Review Act uh, resolution. It needlessly takes a sledgehammer approach to a complicated issue when a scalpel would be better suited. I recognize that supporters of this resolution believe it will provide additional clarity on the Clean Water Act, but let me be clear. It will not. This resolution will not bring back the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, which was rightly rejected by federal, the federal district courts last year and resulted in the restoration of prior Reagan-era regulations as further defined by the Supreme Court in the, in the 2000s. This resolution will not eliminate the use of the significant nexus test because the test, along with the relatively permanent test, was mandated by the Supreme Court in Rapinos and has largely been in effect since the Bush administration. Finally, for those waiting to see whether the Supreme Court will somehow fix this issue in the upcoming Sackett case, this resolution may disappoint as well, as its enactment will likely tie the hands of the Corps 
and of the EPA in responding to any changes the Supreme Court might recommend later this year due to the underlying statute um, authorizing congressional, the congressional review. That's why this resolution makes no sense. It would invalidate the current rule, Biden rule, and all the clarifications, sideboards, and the regulatory exclusions that it contains, many recommended by the same business groups supporting this resolution, and leaving behind a similarly, similarly structured but less clear regulatory framework. It creates more ambiguity, ambiguity and confusion over protecting rivers, streams, and other water bodies to provide drinking water to over 117 million Americans at a time when many states are facing historic droughts. To tie, it ties the hands of federal agencies seeking to help individuals comply with the law unless Congress acts again after, the, after this resolution if it passes on the floor. In my view, this bill will lessen, not increase certainty. It is a big mistake. And I support the current efforts to make sure that critical water infrastructure investments included in the BIL are officially implemented and the public health, the economic, and environmental benefits that will follow are quickly realized. I also support the efforts to protect water quality and provide stakeholders with additional clarity to comply with the Clean Water Act. Finally, I want to make one more note about the waters of the U.S. rule. If the waters of the U.S. debate, the waters of the U.S. rule debate was a member of Congress, its seniority number would be in the double digits. It's been around that long. We've been playing a lot of ping pong with this since about 2007. We need to end it. We should end it by, uh, disapp by disapproving this resolution of disapproval and move on with implementation of what has been proposed by the administration. With that, I yield back. Mr. Rousler, you're recognized for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member McGovern, and uh, members of the committee. It's great to be here with you today. And I'm here uh, in support of H.J. Res 27, and I urge the Rules Committee to grant a closed rule uh, for this resolution. I'm proud to say that uh, more than 170 of our colleagues here in the House uh, have joined this effort as co-sponsors on this legislation introduced by Transportation Committee Chairman Sam Graves and myself. The unfortunate reality is that this resolution is only necessary because of the Biden administration's decision to publish a new definition of waters of the U.S., or WOTUS as we call it, under the Clean Water Act. In our view, this is a very misguided decision, and it's important Congress ensures that this ambiguous and overreaching WOTUS definition has no force. Without question, we can be proud of the Clean Water Act success in protecting the quality of our nation's rivers, lakes, and streams in the 50 years since its passage. However, despite the benefits the Clean Water Act has delivered, its history has been wrought with a tortured past stemming from regulatory headaches and overreach from bureaucrats, all because Congress never defined what a, quote, navigable water is. Many times, this combination has led to uncertainty for individuals and what I'll call the more formal regulated communities. And it strikes me there's a fundamental principle that should always apply and guide the crafting of any type of regulation. It should be simple, clear, and easy to follow. Regulations should carry out the intent of the law in a transparent manner and leave no wiggle room for any bureaucrat to substitute their own biases and hijack the process. And unfortunately, that's not the case with WOTUS. I've said it plenty of times before and will continue to say it as long as it's the case. There's no greater example of bureaucratic overreach under the Clean Water Act than the long-standing regulatory ordeal of understanding and, and complying with the definition of WOTUS. We've heard plenty about this WOTUS definition problem, including from stakeholders across the country at a Water Resources and Environment subcomm Subcommittee hearing we held last month. In that hearing, we heard how years of regulatory headaches and fees can slow or, ha or halt progress on affordable housing projects, as well as the development of critical infrastructure. Farmers are unsure of what they can and cannot do with their land. In my district, for example, frequent storms can cause water to linger in areas that shouldn't be considered wetlands, and they do not affect any flowing body of water. But the inconsistency in the law's interpretation combined with fluctuating weather promises constant headaches and legal wrangling for projects that not only benefit North Carolinians, but for everyday Americans all across the country. The definition of WOTUS is important for a number of applications under the law, including state and tribal water quality certification programs and pollutant discharge permits. 
Additionally, this definition is used to determine who must obtain a permit for dredge and fill material under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. The process for doing so is notoriously expensive and time consuming, and at times has been weaponized to halt projects that some just don't want to allow, regardless of the merits. The penalties of a homeowner, road builder, or farmer, to name a few, if they modify water and the area is later determined to be a WOTUS, they can be uh, subject to staggering fines of tens of thousands of dollars per day or even jail time. Just ask our friend John Duarte from California. Broad and ambiguous definitions of terms such as significant nexus provide trial lawyers plenty of incentive to file suits against farm families and others that might be deemed to have violated the Clean Water Act, albeit, albeit totally and completely unintentionally. So I was heartened when the Trump administration re uh, released the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, or NWPR as we call it back in 2020. This brought clarity and predictability to the nagging question of what is considered a WOTUS while balancing state jurisdiction with federal responsibilities. Under the Trump rule, temporarily flowing water was not included as a navigable water. Uh, the NWPR provided certainty and consistency in its application. And so we are quite dis disappointed when the Biden administration charged ahead with their WOTUS definition, releasing it on December 30th of last year, I might add, in the middle of the busy holiday season. And in addition to that disappointment with the content of the rule, I'm particularly concerned uh, that they have forced it on the public at this specific point in time. For in October 2022, the Supreme Court heard arguments in Sackett versus EPA, a case which has the possibility, not necessarily probability, but possibility of clarifying what a WOTUS is and, can and could render many elements of the Biden rule inapplicable. Common sense, which would suggest the administration wait to see what the Supreme Court decides before ramming this th rule through. Now, my friends in the minority have said and are likely to say again that passage of this CRA will somehow create further uncertainty if the court creates a new test. This CRA simply prohibits a substantially similar rule from moving forward, but this would not prohibit the administration from issuing a separate de definition that is not substantially similar and particularly and hopefully one that would bring clarity and consistency. Now, given the Biden rule will go into effect on March 20th, Congress needs to pass this resolution immediately. Now, in closing, and this is important, and to take a somewhat complicated subject and state it plainly and clearly, this rule is the equivalent, and our friends on the other side won't like it when I say this, but it's true. This rule is the equivalent of a nuclear warhead aimed right at our farmers communities, home builders, road builders, private property owners, among others. The ramifications of its implementation will be far and wide, affecting the prosperity and economic opportunity of all Americans. And as of March 20th, that nuclear warhead is going to be launched. Once the federal government has complete control over the definition of the water because of an arbitrary and inconsistent definition of WOTUS, it will then have control over everything else that is applied to that land or that is on that land, whether it be application of pesticides or herbicides or the building of a fence. Farmers, homeowners, communities, literally anyone who owns property could be prosecuted for these simple actions by bureaucrats who have a different view of the world, such as in cases like Sackett versus EPA. This WOTUS rule, the Biden WOTUS rule, will do nothing to bring forth certainty and consistency, as they say, except for the trial lawyers and radical environmentalists who are most certainly consistent in their work to shut everything down. Again, I urge support of H.J. Res 27, and I welcome any questions. I yield back. Thank both of you for your testimony. The chair has no questions other than just to note I'm a strong supporter of this legislation, as is every other member of my delegation. So appreciate very much you bringing it before the committee. With that, uh, Dr. Burgess, you're recognized for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and really do appreciate the recitation of the timeline. Uh, I was here in 2007 and 2008, and I do recall very clearly being approached by landowners, farmers, developers about what they saw as the hazard that was coming at them because of the rulemaking that was occurring 
in the agency. Look, I, I don't know how, how broadly the understanding is that this becomes enforceable literally in three week, two or three weeks' time. I mean, that's the urgency with us doing the CRA and, and bringing it to the floor because of what people are facing, what the types of fines and disruption that they will encounter if this rule is allowed to become finalized. So uh, while I appreciate the long term that this has been out there and been part of the discussion, I just think it's so critically important that we get this done and that we we give people the certainty that they've been asking for. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. Distinguished ranking members recognize your question. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be brief. Look, at I, I obviously, Mr. Rose, I have a different view of this uh, than you do. Um, and um, and I would be shocked if yeah, otherwise. Well, yeah. No, I, I, I look at it as an attack on our country's clean water. Uh, and um, and I look at it as a tool that would help polluters pass on the cost of cleanup to communities, um, and um, and and I, I think it's a bad idea. But uh, you guys are in charge. You can bring whatever you want to bring to the floor, and you know, and that these are your priorities, uh, but they're not mine. Um, but I really appreciate you being here, and uh, I agree with my colleague, uh, Mr. Larson. Um, and um, any event, I will be voting no on uh, on this. Thank you. Yeah, gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for questions. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Rouse, would you like to respond to that? When you're winning, it's good to stay winning. <laughs> I can't disagree with that. I want to thank both witnesses, both of my good friends, for coming in, and I, I yield back. <laughs> Gentlelady from uh, Pennsylvania is recognized for questions. Thank you. I have to strongly oppose this effort to roll back the Clean Water Act. It's one of our nation's most important environmental protection laws. It stands out as one of the best examples of how the government can create better outcomes for people and communities. It wasn't that long ago, certainly during my lifetime, that most of the waterways in the U.S. were full of pollution, sludge, toxic waste, <coughs> algae blooms, chemicals. Children and pregnant women were advised not to eat fish caught in our lakes and rivers. Uh, some even caught on fire. So today, most of our waterways can be safely used for recreation and other activities, although there's certainly more work to do. However, this House Republican bill would cause a giant step backwards. It would gut the Clean Water Act and make it easier for big business to pollute our waterways, forcing all of us to pay the price for their pollution, and that's the worst kind of corporate welfare. It would also allow large mining and agricultural corporations to dump chemical waste, lift environmental protections on our vulnerable wetlands, and more. So for the past few weeks, we've heard a lot of talk from our colleagues about the train derailment in Ohio, but they're trying to make it easier for companies to pollute here. I don't get it. If this is the agenda, it's no wonder the majority of Americans think that House Republicans are out of touch and not focusing on what's most important to Americans. I yield back. Gentlelady from Minnesota is recognized for question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And when, when I visit with farmers and small businesses in my rural district, uh, this rule and the anxiety surrounding it is far um, one of the most common topics that I hear about. And I will say, when, when Administrator Regan was going through the confirmation hearings in the Senate, he repeatedly claimed that he would work with the agricultural industry and other stakeholders to find the right balance between the Trump administration rule and the 2015 rule. And um, to illustrate that, Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to insert into the record a letter dated February 27th from numerous trade associations, including American Farm Bureau, American Soybean Association, and National Corn Growers. Without objection. Thank you very much. And um, it should be pretty evident from this letter that the biden wotus rule does not strike a balance um, at all um, by virtue of uh, these supported, these organizations that support it. Uh, and uh, Chairman Rouser, um, can you talk about the Biden administration's rule effects uh, on the inflationary, inflationary environment we're seeing? Well, absolutely. And, um, you know, more government regulation always leads to additional cost, which obviously are, are passed on. I'd say uh, also uh, to address some of the comments uh, that have been made, um, there's a different philosophy. Uh, you know, those that want uh, this type of regulation 
uh, seem to view the world as such that the landowner, the farmer, uh, the regulated community uh, is guilty and must be uh, 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 proven innocent. Uh, you know, our landowners, our farmers in particular, take great care uh, with the land. It's a pre precious uh, resource. And what they need is clarity. Uh, what they need is certainty. Uh, so that they know what is what. And I don't think anybody uh, would assume that uh, when you have a heavy rainfall and you have standing water that occasionally runs across the field and goes to a ditch uh, that is very temporary, uh, certainly not permanent in any way, uh, should be classified as a water of the U.S. But yet, these terms are so ambiguous that one person's view of the world versus another person's view of the world, they show up on the farm, they can come to very different conclusions. And unfortunately for the farmer and the landowner, they end up, because of one person's interpretation, uh, you know, they end up uh, paying a penalty or settling, uh, or even worse, uh, you know, going to jail under very extreme circumstance. But the bottom line of all this is investment goes where it's welcome. Productivity, we need more productivity in this country. This rule stays in effect as of March 20th and onward. We're going to have less productivity in this country. And going back to your question about inflation, one of the ways you get out from behind the eight ball of inflation is you have more supply. We're not going to have more supply, supply if uh, investment and in capital is not welcome. Well, and thank you. Um, and I heard you talk about certainty or uncertainty, um, and I hear that from, from my farmers quite a bit, but uh, uncertainty typically means a cost to the consumer um, because they are trying to guess what may happen next. And, um, you know, I think as you look at all of the signers on this letter, you know, that uncertainty is really seeping into every corner, particularly into the ag industry. And I, I have real concerns because I think, uh, uh, you know, this talked about, a better outcome for society um, earlier, but it is not a better outcome for farmers at this point because of the uncertainty and the concern that they have. Um, I just, I absolutely support this legislation. We have to get this under control. Um, the farmers and industry, ag industry in my district is just scrambling um, to try to figure out what is going on with this and, and what they're going to be able to actually do with their land. And I don't think a lot of the... Um, Folks that are talking about, you know, that this is a good thing have actually been out to a farm where a wetland, you know, a little depression in the is now, uh, you know, pr uh, is now protected or considered a water of the U.S. And it just, when you see it, you realize when you're actually out there and see the things that they're calling this, you see the ridiculous no ridiculousness of it. But with that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. General lady from New Mexico is recognized for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chair and Ranking Member, uh, for presenting this. You know, in New Mexico, we always say, agua es vida, water is life, because when you're from a place that, you know, both of you are from places where there is plenty of water, right? Uh, and so I'm from a place where we are very, very cognizant of how precious the water is. And we watch it, actually. Uh, we all pay attention to what the snow melt is every year. I can tell you that until to uh, 10 days ago, it was, a, uh, it was really bad, and now we're at 114%, uh, because that's what we do, is we watch what the snow melt is. Because we know that what happens, uh, ranking member, like which direction does water flow? Downhill. Downhill. And so if water is flowing downhill, what happens if there is uh, pollutants, whether it be a chemical spill, like Palestinian, uh, East Palestine, or, or something else, what happens? Um, the people downhill drink the dirty water, or they don't drink water at all. Right. And I can tell you that we have, in way too many instances, where we have had our surface waters, where we often pool for our drinking water, uh, contaminated and been unable uh, to utilize those. I will also point out that I think that, uh, uh, and, and this is an older figure, but at one point in time it was about 83% of those who are anglers and who utilize our beautiful waters for fishing also very concerned about dirty water. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit, about the economic impact of? Oh, I can. It, it, certainly in the Pacific Northwest, uh, 
quite a strong fishing industry as well. And uh, one thing you hear a lot about is uh, uh, surf surface runner water runoff, bringing pollutants, bringing contaminants into the estuaries that we depend upon to build up fish populations so that it can support a recreational and commercial fishery. People who work in my district, uh, people who rely on fisheries to pay rent, to pay for food. So it's, it, the cleanliness of the water is intrinsically tied to the health of the economy. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, talking about the distinction between uh, your districts and my districts, do you, uh, Mr. Chair, are you aware of uh, what the impact would be on the percentage of waters that would not be protected if we overturned this in a place like Arizona and New Mexico? Well, I think it's important uh, to understand that uh, the only thing that we are repealing here uh, is this uh, what we consider to be a very ambiguous, uh, overreaching uh, WOTUS rule. Uh, we are not uh, repealing, uh, for example, in the state of North Carolina, our uh, Department of Environmental Quality has delegated authority by the EPA to address clean water issues. Uh, we're not repealing anything that any state is, is doing, and, and I'm sure that uh, in New Mexico, uh, they're doing everything that they possibly can to ensure yeah. that you have clean water. So, uh, you know, this is not a CRA that is uh, wiping out anything other than what we find to be a very ambiguous and uh, overreaching definition of a water of the United States. So, Chairman uh, and, and Ranking Member, you might know this, but in places like Arizona and New Mexico, we would basically uh, no longer be protecting, uh, probably about 90% of the waters would no longer be protected under the Clean Water Act. Is that, does that sound familiar? Uh, uh, I'm not familiar with the, te uh, the, uh, the number exactly, but I know during the uh, debate on committee, um, representatives from Mexico, on the, uh, from, uh, from New Mexico, from Arizona, uh, on the committee made this case. Right. And so I think that that's like a real concern about places where there is nexus to navigable waters, uh, but it might not be every single day of the year, um, that there might be sometimes when it's dry. The Rio Grande ran dry this year, right? The main water artery of uh, the state of New Mexico ran dry because of climate uh, change. And so I think that's another big concern because you talk about what impact uh, we might see given the, dr the drought in western states uh, if we uh, roll back uh, this rule. Yeah, the uh, re uh, representative from Arizona um, on the committee made this very case. You know, in a state like Washington State, where water, rivers, creeks run mostly 24-7, 365 days a year, um, that's not the problem. But in other states, Arizona, New Mexico, where you have um, uh, a lot of waterways, uh, creeks, rivers, that do not run all year, but are clearly rivers or creeks, because when it does rain, when you do get rain, that is the waterway that is used to move water. Those need to be protected. And uh, if you want uncertainty about protecting the water that will eventually run through those, um, when you do get the rains, then you, um, if you want uncertainty, then you should vote for this Congressional Review Act uh, res you know, resolution. It, w it will bring uncertainty. It will bring uncertainty to farmers. It will bring uncertainty to uh, um, developers. It will bring uncertainty, importantly, to the families who rely on clean water in this country. Yeah, and I really I, I, thank you. I appreciate you raising the fact that, indeed, what, what this rule is trying to do is simple in the sense that water runs downstream, right? And we need certainty. And that un, uh, overturning the rule would bring uncertainty. And, and the, also touching on the patchwork issue with regards to what happens with the fact that we'll, if we overturn this, we'll have sort of patchwork of uh, who, who's supposed to be regulating, what should we be doing, especially like when we do have a chemical spill. Can you speak to that? In my view, it'll bring further uncertainty. Under the Clean Water Act, states are, can be, not all of them, but states can be delegated with the authorities to enforce the Clean Water Act um, to a, at a minimum standard, then they can go higher than that. But if you then uh, undercut one of the, um, one of those, provisions, one of those legs on the stool, if you will, by overturning the waters of the, of the U.S. rule, um, then that would kind of Katie bar the door a little bit, open the door on what states and how states will uh, enforce the Clean Water Act. Again, bringing further uncertainty to what's going to happen if you're doing it state by state as opposed to having an established uh, federal standard. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate the fact that uh, this rule really is about putting people over polluters 
Uh, you know, it is it is putting people over the political expediency of, uh, you know, uh, overturning a rule that is so important uh, because clean water is life, right? Dirty water just gets you sick. And so uh, uh, that I am uh, going, uh, strongly opposed uh, this and uh, will be urging my uh, colleagues to vote against it. Thank you so very much for your answers. And I really, you know, wish we had more water like you did, although I do believe that our, our mountains and uh, our, that I do live in the most beautiful district of the country. <laughs> Gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for questions. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. I, I want to agree that the WOTUS, the 2023 WOTUS rule is going to provide certainty. The certainty it's going to provide is if a drop of rain lands on your property, whether you have a, a stream or a river or a pond or not, the federal government is going to show up and tell you what you can and can't do by virtue of that water droplet, even a molecule of it appearing. That's eventually where we're going to end up. Uh, Ranking Member Larson, I've, I think you've been in Congress longer than I have, uh, but we've both been on the Transportation Committee at least 10 years, I think. Uh, and you're right. You said something in the beginning. This is, this is a game of ping pong, the WOTUS rule. There, was, there were rules under Bush, and then Obama came up with a different version of the rule, and then Trump came up with a different version of the rule, and now Biden's got his version of the rule. And my home builders and my farmers they're just saying, I don't really care that much what the rule is. Just quit changing it on me because I can adapt as long as I know what the rule is going to be. And this is why the founders set up our system of government so well. I, although sometimes I feel like we're cavemen and we just dis been discovered. We're looking at an electric motor. We don't even have any concept of the beauty of what they've created. And their idea was that You'd have one branch that creates the laws, and then you would have a branch that enforces the laws, and then another branch to adjudicate disagreements. But w what we have here is the legislative branch has just given up all control over this law. But they didn't give it up, our, our predecessors, in 1972, to quote, Susan Bodine, who was the, uh, one of our witnesses in a hearing on this topic, on this very uh, bill that we're, we're talking about passing a resolution, she said, in 1972, Congress didn't tell the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers, do whatever you all think you need to do to protect uh, water. That was not the directive. There were, there were boundaries on it. And so instead of Congress reconvening and when there need to be changes, or maybe need to be changes, to debate this and, and debate what the, the law or the rule should be, we, uh, we're here arguing over what the executive branch did. Uh, and I think it's, I, I support what, what we're doing here, I support it completely, uh, which is to tell the executive branch, no, you can't have this new rule. Uh, our, our, constituents would be far better served if we followed the principle of we make the laws. Now, the, the minority, they were in the majority. You all had the, the, the committee of jurisdiction in, in both uh, lawmaking bodies. The White House could have made the changes that are in this and, and Biden's role that you uh, seem to like, could have made those changes but did not. And I, and I wonder why um, those changes weren't made. There's, let me ask you, Mr. Larson, because we, we were in the, uh, in the hearing again uh, together on this issue. Um, Ms. Bodine, who I've already quoted, she said something to me that was very concerning. And I want to know if you agree with her interpretation of the 2023 WOTUS rule or if you disagree with what she said, she said to support expanded jurisdiction over the 2023 WOTUS rule, the agencies claim isolated water can affect the integrity of navigable water. Uh, well, let's see, that's not exactly the page I, I wanted. Um, let me pull this up. They, 
they, they claim, the agencies claim that an isolated water can affect the biological integrity of a navigable water. So this is how they apply that significant nexus. They say the biological integrity of an isolated bit of water it will affect navigable water. And they use examples like salmon. But to understand what they really mean, you have to look at their technical support document. And the, that document supports the 2023 WOTUS rule, reveals that the agencies believe they can claim jurisdiction over an isolated water if they determine that birds can fly from the isolated water to a navigable water and leave bird droppings that contain seeds of aquatic plants, or they determine that beavers that live in isolated water can move from the pond to a tributary of navigable water and leave scat that includes larvae of aquatic insects. The agencies call this dispersal. Is it true? Is she just making this up? Or is it true that the 2023 WOTUS rule would expand jurisdiction to include isolated bodies of water by establishing this biological nexus? Uh, I couldn't speak to what she said, uh, uh, Mr. Massey. I, I, I don't know that. If she's making a claim, I will note that before the Bush administration adopted rules, uh, I kind of want to talk about the, the original sin, if you will, was the Supreme Court making um, not not compatible but not incompatible decisions by creating two different tests in two different cases, Rapinos and Swank, which gave us this relatively um, uh, relative significance versus the nexus test. And then the Bush administration was trying to square a circle based on that, which then, uh, when we had the majority and the Democrats the majority in 2007, had a series of hearings on this to try to do what you just talked about. Why didn't why didn't why didn't the majority, the Democratic majority, do that um, in whatever year you mentioned? I'm, I'm talking about even farther back. Well, then we could even say in 2010 or 11, the new Republican majority also did not address this when they had the opportunity. Um, and so I, I don't know that it's helpful to go back and say why didn't you do something when we each well, when each party had the chance to do them. I'll give My you more point. time. Let me, let me respond I, to that. I understand you guys have plenty of time. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> yeah, and I will. That's why, that's why I'm, I'm going to give you all you want. Uh, but I, but I did uh, want to respond to that. Uh, it's because the Republican majority doesn't think they have the authority to do what they're doing. Not that we think they need more authority, and that we would want to convene. A meeting of this body and the other body and, and get a president to sign something to give them more authority. That's not necessarily, it's not my viewpoint. I can't speak for all of my party. But you make a fair point. So, so my, my, my basic point, Mr. Chair, is just this, that passing the CRA, passing this particular one to undercut the waters of the U.S. Uh, rule um, creates uncertainty. It's essentially kicking it to a Supreme Court, the same institution that started things in the first place, and uh, for better or for worse, it's not a criticism of the court, but that's where it started. My only, so my point is, if you want certainty, we should stop the ping pong game and get on with things. Um, but that's not going to occur, uh, in my view, um, with uh, action to pass this, this particular CRA. So the waters of the US rule is about clean water, that's what we're trying to get to. This, let me get back to my question. So Ms. Bodine established that this waters, and here's, here's uh, the she, she testified to that. I don't know if she established anything. Okay, she testified, she testified so I want you to comment on the veracity of her testimony. And if, and if we can't know what she said was correct or incorrect, then this thing's too fuzzy already. I mean, we are, the three of us here are on this committee. And if we can't even tell, then how's the Army Corps of Engineer uh, commander in Louisville going to interpret it? And how's the one in Huntington, West Virginia, going to interpret it? Because they both have jurisdiction in Kentucky. And uh, how is the EPA going to interpret it? How will the state of Ohio versus the state of Kentucky interpret it? Because this is the other problem we have. When, when we pass fuzzy law and then the regulators pass a fuzzy regulations, it doesn't get applied evenly, even where the hydrology and, and the climate are similar. They're, the rule becomes two different rules in two different states or two different Army Corps districts. I'll just go back to what I said uh, earlier to a question is that um, 
if this passes under the, the underlying statute of the Congressional Review Act, prevents the agencies from writing anything that is uh, s similar, even close to um, what we already have or even had. To date, after 15, 16 years, no one has been able to magically concoct something that is substantially different um, uh, than, than the next administration. Different enough for us to have disagreements. But, but I don't see, if, if the CRA passes, how the agencies will have an opportunity to do what you're just doing is try to bring some consistent um, definition over time to a Waters of the U.S. rule. Let me ask my question differently. I don't have a different answer, Mr. Chair. Well, I have a different question. And this one I think you, you could answer if you care to. If you don't, just tell me you don't want to answer it. Uh, <laughs> if Ms. Bodine were correct that the WOTUS 2023 rule uh, uses a biological connections of, of beavers that may drop scat or birds that have droppings that may have... Uh, you know, uh, fish eggs in them or something, or that frogs can carry eggs from one pond to another, some kind of biological uh, plant. Uh, if she were correct that that is the intent of the 2023 WOTUS rule to use those biological connections to expand jurisdiction, if she, that is correct, would you support it or not support uh, that portion of the I'll be voting no on the CRA on HR 20, on race test 27. I'm, the reason I'm asking this question is it's the clearest example of some common sense thing that I heard in that hearing that my farmers back home can understand that they are, that, you know, they are coming after, and I know farm ponds may be exempt, but let's say you're a home builder and you've got a pond in your neighborhood. They're coming after your pond they understand that because anybody who's built a pond and left it there for two or three years knows that fish show up. You don't have to put fish in it. Now, you want to put the fish you want to be in it, but if you don't put fish in it, they show up. They get there because birds and frogs and beavers do carry this stuff. So we know biologically all water is connected. It eventually gets connected somehow. Maybe it's through the rain. But um, that's what people are worried about. That's, that's one of the legitimate concerns that a witness in our committee expressed about this rule, how it could expand jurisdiction. And my folks back home were watching that saying, yeah, that happens in my ponds. I, I, you know, I can't, I can't, I couldn't show up and testify that my pond's not biologically connected through bird droppings. We all know birds fly and do that. So um, they're rightfully concerned. And because they know, as Mr. Rouser said, they're going to be guilty until proven innocent. I, I had uh, a constituent who asked me, why can't we just do things, and as long as we're not polluting, why do we have to go say, mother, may I, to several agencies um, to, to get this approval? Um, is there anything I've talked about here, Mr. Rouser, Chairman? Or, sorry. No, I, I think you've hit all, all the real key points. I will say this. If this rule stays in effect, uh, farmers are going to have to go hire consultants like they've never had to hire before and lawyers and everything else. And it's just going to make uh, production agriculture that much more difficult when the margins are so thin anyway. And, um, you know, as far as the... Um, uh, the ability of the administration to come forward with a, a new rule, there's nothing that prohibits that. For example, if they were to use the Scalia standard and promulgate a rule based on that, there's nothing in this CRA that would prevent uh, common sense and logic from prevailing in an administration if they chose to pursue it. Um, so that, those are my closing comments on, on that. So we, we once had um, a hearing on the WOTUS, two, two or three WOTUSes back, in the science committee, because not only is this Groundhog Day in the, in the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, it's, this WOTUS thing shows up in every committee. If you've been in Congress, you've seen it. And we had Gina McCarthy there at, in the science committee. And one of the questions I asked her is, can you do science without units of measure? Can you do science without numbers, without math? And she said that, you know, it would be difficult. Uh, 
you know, like flow is gallons per hour, or you might describe a, a flood as a 50-year event, meaning probability-wise it happens once every 50 years. These terms of units and numbers don't show up in these rules. They are not in the rules. And what I heard here earlier from uh, one of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle and the minority witness is that the rules have to be stretchy. They have to uh, not faithfully apply in Kentucky because they've also got to apply in New Mexico. Uh, so that's what our constituents are upset about or concerned about. The, the rules in these rules, I, I think, uh, Mr. Rouser, you said they should be simple, clear, and easy to follow. They're anything but that. And there was just an argument made for why they can't be simple, clear, and easy to follow, because they have to cover all 50 states. Well, that sounded like a great argument for federalism. To me, That you, it sounded almost like when I heard the two talking that, oh, it's got to be uh, rivers that flow only occasionally, because that's what happens in five states in the West. But in Kentucky, when we talk about something that only flows occasionally, we're usually talking about a ditch or a, a stream so small that you would not cast a, uh, a fishing line in it because <laughs> you're not going to catch anything. You might catch crawdads in it, but that's about it. So uh, I think there's a reason that these things should be left, more of these decisions should be left up to the states. I think there's a reason that the definitions need to be clear, simple, and easy to follow. I think we've seen here today that we we don't even know exactly what this thing means. We gotta wait for the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers to start trying to implement this, and then we'll find out what was the date, Mr. Rouser. This March twentieth. March twentieth. We're gonna find out what it means. We got we have to allow this regulation to happen so we can find out what's in it, and that's concerning to me. Uh, and I don't think there's much more I can say about it, but I uh, thank you for bringing forward this. Thank you both for testifying. Try to keep the animosity to a minimum because I know I have to be in a committee with you this week. <laughs> and I yield back. Gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, this is real up close and personal with me. Uh, on a related note that our, our friends of mine are going through building a hotel at the beach, and uh, guess what? They, why they're having to shut down the, their whole construction operation at a certain time. The lights at night uh, for subcontractors who want to work are affecting turtles. Are affecting turtles. They're having to shut down a complete project at different hours. Now, it just goes to show you the the ridiculous regulations that. Uh, that the government is trying to, to to put on the taxpayers and more particularly the farmers. Uh, do y'all realize this? Uh, if it allows to go unchecked, if you uh, cut a ditch, if you have to have some drainage, if you have to clear some farmland, that you have to wait on some bureaucrat at EPA or Army Corps of Engineers. And God help you if you're trying to plan a in the planting season, because planting occurs at certain times all over the country. Have you, have, and I'll ask both of, of you this. Do y'all actually have farmers in your district that are weighing in on the damage that this is doing to the farming industry, the very people that are putting food on our table or are trying to? And Mr. Uh, Rise, I'll start with you. Well, absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, this, uh, this has been an issue of concern for some time. There's all this talk about if we were to repeal uh, the WOTUS uh, rule creates more uncertainty, there's been uncertainty the whole time. Uh, what this rule would do would make it even more uncertain, more ambiguous, uh, and like I said, every farmer out there is going to have to hire consultants and lawyers just to give themselves a, a fighting chance to survive, and that's the fundamental problem. It doesn't have to be this way, and yes, when uh, we prevail and, and let's say a miracle happens and the president signs this thing, which obviously he's not gonna do, but let's, let's say in case that did occur, yeah, there's still gonna be uncertainty, but we're not adding on. We're not making things worse. So I yield back. 
Yeah, first, uh, I think it's a, I want to make an important point, at least for my district and the great farmers who are there, who um, uh, largest raspberry producing country, uh, county in the country. Um, so if you eat raspberries, uh, they're likely from my district, grown in the soils of uh, Whatcom County. Same with blueberries. Potato growers that, that export their potatoes uh, all over the world. Dairy farmers who export their product, uh, not just um, not, not just produce for Washington State and the country, but export their product all over the world. The point is, uh, Democrats represent farmers too. Uh, Democrats, okay, for Democrats represent rural areas too. And the farmers uh, I've talked to, they have their many issues. This is not on top of their list. It may be on the list. Immigration reform is on the top of their list. Ensuring that we've got an immigration system that allows for a stable supply of workers uh, for, our, uh, for our farmers is number one uh, on their list. Trade is number two on their list. Those are the issues that I hear from my farmers constantly. I do not hear from this. I would note, since we started this debate, and I don't mean at 4 o'clock, I mean at 2007, plenty of homes have been built in my district. Plenty of land has been planted. Plenty of ditches have been cut since that time. So, I, it so was, this is not shut down farming. This is not shut down home development. Okay, well, here's what I would urge you to do. Show them the effect that when, when this goes into effect, what is it, March? Uh, March 20th. March 20th. Show them, and just as you represent them, show them what this will do. Now, if it's not one or two after this is implemented, it would shock me for anybody to say this isn't a, this isn't a travesty. And they will tell you, I, I can't, it, it would shock me if anybody says, you know, this is really helping me. I'm, I'm able to produce the product quicker at a lower price. And, uh, I, you know, it, 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 Thomas, we may have been at the same hearing in space and technology when you had a farmer from Texas who was crying, basically, and appealing to the committee over trying to cut a logging road and having to get a permit and having to put silt fence, which is, very expensive to put up iron post uh, every every uh, every inch of the way for a logging road that's going to be discontinued. That's what this is doing. And I tell you, um, when they get the price tag and no return, and David, um, <laughs> it's not just attorneys. It's to try to interpretate, interpret what some bureaucrat is thinking in his mind and making up regulations. I've got a I've got a, a peach farmer, been been producing peaches for 75 years. Y'all's office gets peaches uh, when he comes up, small uh, small batches. Farms 7,000 acres. The topography of their land is not all flat. It goes up and then it goes down. And God help him to have to expand his farm or even maintain it to have to abide by what this this uh, 404 would do. Um, God help people who are landlocked, who are wanting to put, uh, wanting to, to try to grow something and, and try to clear it, plow it, and can't get access, um, uh, make it more difficult to, you know, maintain the adjacent property, but to use their property. This is so, this is such a overreach. Um, and this is on top of every other problem that farmers are having. When you go out in South Carolina, and I'm sure North Carolina, uh, and see the tractors that are sitting, were sitting back in March, uh, they were paying lease rates on their trucks, fertilizer spreader trucks. They couldn't get fertilizer. Uh, when they couldn't run the trucks because they didn't know if they could pay for the fuel, much less what the fuel price was going to be. And it's just been one cascade of, of increase after increase. They didn't know whether they wanted to plant the crops. Um, and it's... You know, and I'm sure Biden's going to, uh, I don't know how much farming he's done in his 50 years in political office, but if he knew this, if he had to make a profit, if he had to actually do something, go to work, he would say this is a, this is a killer for what he is trying to do. Um, and I guess like Sonny Perdue said when he was taking questions years ago when he was ag commissioner, he said, okay, guys, make, let China make all your food. If you're going to do this, let China do it. How's that going to work out? So uh, thank you both for testifying. Thank you for, for bringing this to our uh, you know, attention. It's probably going to, uh, I think it'll pass the House, and we'll see how it goes with President Biden. I have no hopes with this administration uh, on what, what they're doing. Uh, 
I yield Just, to. Would the gentleman yield for a question? I would. Who has the better peaches, South Carolina or North Carolina? <laughs> South Carolina. David, David would admit that. We <laughs> well, have better Texas. peaches. <laughs> we got really good blueberries and strawberries. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, no, thank you for testifying. But this is very serious. And five, I, I saw a figure in here, $500. Uh, $500 won't touch this per occurrence. I mean, I've had to feel, I've had to try to appease, you know, these bureaucrats. You can't please them. You can't hire enough lawyers. And uh, I guess for those of, for those who um, like this, then let's see how it comes. Let's see how when, when the farmers are not able to produce their crops at a profit, that maybe China can produce them at a better profit that are corona-free peaches, that are corona-free corn. Uh, and see how that how it works out. Uh, I yield back. To my friend from uh, North Carolina, don't uh, give up hoping on miracles. This president will sometimes surprise you as to what he will and won't sign, as some of my Democratic <laughs> friends might uh, might testify to. So that uh, the gentleman from Texas recognized for question. I think the chairman, um, while we've been sitting here, one of our colleagues, uh, Kelly Armstrong from North Dakota was making the point that this is not a fight between regulation and no regulation. It's a fight between uh, uh, federal regulation and state regulation and, and, and who should have the power there, which is obviously at the core of the Constitution and, frankly, at the core of most of the disagreements we have in this body. Um, he points out that the uh, North Dakota Ag Commissioner uh, suggests that 86 to 94 percent of North Dakota would fall under WOTUS. I don't know if he's correct or not, but he's the Ag Commissioner of North Dakota. So I would tend to defer to him on his interpretation of how this is going to impact North Dakota. Now, frankly, as big of a drought as we're having in the hill country right now, uh, we're not going to have any problem with standing water, uh, and certainly not on the hill I sit on, but, but, it's a, but it is a problem uh, for a state like Texas as well, in different parts of the state of Texas. Um, look, the ambiguity of the rule is the problem. And if you're going to make an error in one direction or the other, the ambiguity of the rule, you want it to be certain, yes, but certain on the side of property rights and the individuals that need to carry out the activity on their dirt. It's their dirt. And, and to allow them the ability to be able to carry that out. You know, we've got individuals, I mean, obviously the case in front of the court currently, the Sackett family, right? I mean, that it's, just, it's an Idaho, Idaho family who'd started building a home. And then the feds step in and say, sorry, yeah, you got to pay us $75,000. And, and, you know, the, for the court now, I mean, for the, for the administration now to say, oh, we've, we've got the magic bullet here. We're going to just make it to where pretty much any time water touches your land, you're under the auspices of some federal bureaucrat. And then they can be weaponized against you to come in and come, oh, sorry, you spent $75,000. Uh, too friggin' bad, right? And, and the, the, we just gloss over that like that's no problem. Like that's just suddenly, oh, that's fine, right? We don't worry about takings jurisprudence at all during any of this nonsense, particularly, for example, when government was shutting down businesses during COVID. So, you know, oh, sorry, shut down your business. Here we're like, sorry, shut down your property. Um, and, and I think that's at, at the core of, of, the, of the concern here and why the CRA is so important and uh, you know, I would I would note that the example of of the of the 77 year old Navy veteran Joe Robertson, uh, when the EPA imprisoned him for 18 months for building ponds on his Montana property to fight forest fires without a permit. It was 40 miles from the nearest major river, but the EPA claimed the foot wide channel he used to fill his ponds was commercially navigable water. He died in 2019, just a month before the Supreme Court overturned his conviction and reversed his fine. I don't know the exact specific facts of the case, but that's not a good spot for us to be in, in terms of the exercise of authority by the federal government over the people. Uh, Chairman Rouser, do you agree? Well, absolutely I do. And, um, you know, to give you a quick example, uh, in North Carolina, I know a particular farmer uh, with land. Um, the NRCS comes out and says it's a wetland. The Army Corps of Engineers says it's not. Uh, you know, and so, you know, all this, all this ambiguity, uh, uh, you know, adds time, adds cost, and, and, and really it's totally completely unnecessary. This rule would just add to it, and uh, so it definitely needs to be repealed.
Well, when um, in the uh, Rapinoe's opinion, when uh, Justice Scalia wrote that the the um, uh, phrase, the waters of the United States, includes only those relatively permanent standing or continuously flowing bodies of water, forming geographic features, et cetera, et cetera. Um, later, the act's use of the traditional phrase, navigable waters, further confirms the CWA confers jurisdiction only over relatively permanent bodies of water. That line of reasoning makes a hell of a lot more sense to me in terms of what you're talking about with respect to federal authority. Uh, not, and then and leaving the rest to state authority. Again, the, 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 to, to the response to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, this isn't about regulation or no regulation. Nobody sitting in Texas where I live or in any of the jurisdictions in which we live and represent wants dirt or poison or bad things in the water that their children drink. Literally no one wants that or advocates for it. Nobody. But what we don't want is a bureaucrat sitting in one of these godforsaken buildings in this godforsaken town, stepping in and coming into the people that I represent and telling them, you can't build a house here, you can't engage in your business, you can't do what you want to do because we say so. That's the fundamental problem. And when every time we increase the power of the federal government to do this, we give a bureaucrat the ability to do that to an American citizen engaging in their God-given way of life. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady from Indiana has recognized her questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm so glad we're considering H.J. Res 27 to block the Biden administration's new Waters of the United States rule. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of this legislation and glad the committee is considering a rule for its consideration on the House floor. Over 20 states, including my home state of Indiana, signed the amicus brief with respect to the pending Sackett case before the Supreme Court. This regulation is a serious issue for many Hoosiers, whether they're land developers, business owners, or farmers. Uh, in fact, I have a statement, uh, Mr. Chairman, from the Indiana Farm Bureau urging support for H.J. Res 27 that I would like to, uh, unanimous consent to add Without to that. objection. Thank you. Uh, it's one of the issues that I hear most about uh, when I'm back home in my district. I hear it from farmers, from housing developers, from friends and neighbors. Um, and I find it, um, you know, we're talking about waters of the USA. Uh, some of my constituents joke that in a hard rain, uh, the ditch in their backyard becomes uh, the uh, waters of the USA regulated by the federal government. Seems a little extreme to me. But that is exactly um, what my understanding is of this Biden rule. Um, I imagine that that's not unique across the country. Um, farmers in particular are taking uh, issue with this uh, rule. Um, are those fair statements, Representative Rouser? Well, I think they are, and certainly my growers, my farmers back home would, would agree with that uh, assessment completely. Representative Rouser, I know this is an issue that has a lot of different facets, um, but as your committee has considered this issue, what is the single most compelling reason that, to, in your opinion, that it's necessary? Well, again, uh, the ambiguity, uh, I think uh, we've touched on this uh, multiple different ways, but, uh, you know, different people have different views of, of, uh, of the standard, uh, you know, basically. Uh, and you're going to have a lot of uh, uh, different scenarios around the country where what one person does in North Carolina, uh, you know, the bureaucrat that is called to ask to check it out is going to say, oh, you know, this is all fine. Uh, same situation somewhere else in the country, they'll be bringing down the hammer. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's not fair to anyone. Uh, again, I'll make the point that um, none of us are opposed to having rules of the road. I mean, you need to know uh, when to stop, you need to know when to yield, et cetera. Uh, but you don't need a stop sign every 10 feet. Um, you know, uh, rules and regulations should facilitate uh, clean water and, and, and progress and prosperity, uh, not, uh, not hinder it, uh, not, uh, not be an obstacle, uh, you know, to it. Uh, we have the most, uh, our natural resources that we have in this country are so plentiful. Uh, we're very blessed in that regard, but we're basically going to, uh, you know, run our folks out of business uh, with this. Again, capital investment goes where it's welcome. Um, you know, if you have an occupation where you got to hire consultants and lawyers all the time just to keep yourself from going to jail, that doesn't sound like a very good occupation to get in. I mean, we have a hard enough time now getting folks to come back home and, and farm the land. 
uh, productivity for this country is really incredibly important. Rules, regulations, onerous taxes, uh, ambiguous rules and regulations in particular just do nothing but hinder that. So all that's in the balance here. Thank you. Um, I, I want to note, because you mentioned a stop sign every 10 feet. Um, pardon me, Mr. Massey. Um, I, I wanted to mention, since you mentioned the stop sign every 10 feet, um, under the Obama era Waters of the USA rule, in my district we have Highway 37 that goes up from, um, it, it runs north and south in the state of Indiana. I would take it from Bedford, Mitchell, you know, all the way up past Bloomington. And literally every tenth of a mile under the Obama era rule, there was a sign in a ditch that said Waters of the USA. It was every, it, it, even less than that, probably every few feet. It seemed a, a little over-regulatory to me. Permitting and regulatory compliance um, cur before Waters of the USA accounts for nearly 25% of the cost of a single family home. The National Association of Home Builders Chairman Alicia Hue Huey called the rule a blow to housing affordability, stating that housing affordability is already at a 10 year low. Uh, the National Association of Home Builders states, if the administration is truly interested in knocking down barriers to affordable housing, it will direct the EPA and the US Army Corps of Engineers to keep from in implementing this rule until the Supreme Court issues its ruling on the Sackett case. In July of 2022, Ways and Means Committee leader, Representative Kevin Brady of Texas noticed, noted that the average home price has gone up $100,000 since President Biden took office. $100,000 more. Representative Rouser, does adding more regulatory costs to housing development make it more affordable or less affordable for home buyers? Well, certainly less affordable. And, um, you know, the home, homeowners, home builders, and homeowners too, um, you know, are going are gonna to face this, uh, this uh, rule implemented in its full form. And basically this rule, uh, don't be fooled, this rule really is the 2015 Obama-era rule, uh, but it's cloaked a little differently. Uh, but in, in, in effect, it's, it's more or less the same. And one thing I might add here, <clears throat> I had uh, the team count up how many times the word may is included in the regulation. 383 times. That's pretty, that, that's a wide, May is a uh, wide range of uh, possibilities. In the state uh, legislature, you know, you change a May to a shall or a shall to a May. When you change a shall to a May, the ambiguity there can lead, as particularly under regulation, uh, can lead the folks reading that statute uh, straight into court, um, which again adds to the cost of doing business. Uh, my next, my last question is for Ranking Member Larson. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm really, I'm not trying to be um, uh, coy in my question, but is Washington State the same as the state of Indiana? Um, yes, we're both, uh, we're two of the top specialty crop producing uh, states in the country. In all ways, Washington as, State as is as the same as the state of Indiana. In no, all Washington ways. State's much better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have never been to Washington State, so I can't argue that. Although the state of Indiana, I'd invite you to join it. It's pretty great. I mean, I will. I think what you're getting at is the is the federal state um, partnership, the federalism issue, and so on. Keep in mind, the Clean Water Act established a floor uh, nationally and allowed states then to on clean water to go up from there, but not below that. Uh, but um, water water does not respect state boundaries, which is why the waters of the U.S. rule is called what it is, because water as it flows does not respect it. Hardly respects international boundaries. Um, uh, thinking of my friend from North Dakota um, and Devil's Lake uh, and the issues they have have there, but certainly the Columbia River starts in British Columbia, comes down through Washington State, the Rio Grande um, separates uh, two countries. So not only does it, the water does not respect um, international boundaries, it doesn't respect the state boundaries, which is why when you talk about the waters of the U.S., there's this discussion about uh, um, having a standard um, uh, for that, that is called a waters of the U.S. rule. So yeah, Indiana and Washington are alike in many respects. You're better at basketball, <laughs> granted. Um, but, uh, um, but when it comes to the regulatory structure of the Clean Water Act and the waters of the U.S., it is important that uh, we have some minimum standards and not just let states establish their own standards. Otherwise, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be receiving Canada's or uh, I'll be... I'll, Oregon, Oregon, I'll be receiving Oregon's dirty water, or they'll be receiving our clean water, or vice versa. I mean, that 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 would that circumstance would exist no matter where okay. we were in the country. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, Representative Rouser, um, to that point, um, would it surprise you to know that the state of Indiana implemented environmental rules that were more restrictive than the federal EPA? No, not at all. And we're doing nothing to repeal those with this, let and, the record state. And does the, the Trump era rule uh, provide a floor? Does it provide what? A floor of a standard. Uh, well, not as it relates to those individual state laws. That's a separate, that's a separate issue. Uh, what the Trump regulation did was it brought clarity and conformity, uh, which, by the way, makes it a whole lot easier to enforce, uh, which, I should add, uh, adds to our ability to protect clean water. Just to clarify, we, we're not saying no regulations. That's right. Uh, thank you for your uh, answering my questions. How much government is too much government, I think, is, is where this falls for me. When, when federal bureaucrats, by rule, are essentially, in my view, taking adverse possession of private property under WOTUS. Uh, the opponents of this bill want to regulate our very backyards. Um, that's a step too far for me. It's a step too far for my constituents. It's a step too far for farmers, developers. It's a step too far for the American people. I'm happy to support it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from New York is recognized for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Rouser, as the new WOTUS rule currently stands, bottom line, simple terms, what will this mean for a farmer who happens to have a small stream that occasionally forms after a rainstorm? Well, it depends upon how the uh, bureaucracy decides to interpret uh, the rule, uh, which is one of the fun fundamental problems, um, and, and which is the reason why the agriculture community, mayors, Democrat, Republican across the board, uh, were so concerned with the uh, 2015 Obama rule and were so delighted uh, with the Trump uh, rewrite of that rule or replacement of that rule. Uh, so this uh, this basically is going back to the Obama era rule, but it's cloaked a little a little nicer, so it appears to be a little better, um, but it really is not. Uh, and again, when you have the word "may" 383 times uh, throughout a regulation, uh, that uh, suggests to me that you're going to have a wide range of uh, interpretation and therefore a wide range. Uh, of, of different types of enforcement. Where we're on one side of the country, it's not at all, and on the other side, uh, they're getting the hammer. And that, again, that's not fair to anybody, and it's certainly not advancing the goal of clean water. Thank you. And, and that's what it comes down to, the people in my district, in the southern tier in western New York, agricultural communities. It's just the lack of certainty and the financial hardship. Uh, this rule creates an enormous lack of certainty for our farmers, our small businesses, in our rural communities in, in general. I, I think it's truly an assault on rural America. Uh, and when I see the overreach occurring with the administration's new WOTUS rule, I see the thousands of dollars in penalties that a dairy farmer in the southern tier of New York might be forced to shell out. You know, that's thousands they can't spare because the cost of everything from, you know, onerous policies put in place by an overreaching state government you know, in, in, in dark blue New York that have already done, you know, that with uh, the high costs of energy and the high regulations uh, and uncertainties in the future of energy in our state because of uh, state and then federal regulations. And then the strains of labor uh, to the inputs, those are already sky high. It is the imperative of this Congress to reverse the administration's course. And it's our duty to review where potential overreach has occurred and it's indeed incurred here with, with this WOTUS rule. And I strongly support this resolution. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. I want to uh, thank our witnesses for coming before us today. You've been very patient, and we appreciate it because it's an important topic. Uh, I do just say this for the, uh, uh, the edification of the committee. Remember, we do have another panel, and I expect quite a few amendments later this evening. So. I, this issue, I, it, believe me, is very regional in some ways. It really, I hear about this constantly in my district. I have 13,000 farms and ranches. So uh, it's a big, big deal. So I understand the passion, but not directed, obviously, at our witnesses. But for our members, let's try and move along if we can going forward. Uh, but I'm glad we had a fulsome discussion on this. I think it's a very important issue. And again, I thank both of you for your patience and your participation. You're excused.
Our Democratic uh, witness, just as our Republican witness last time, has not yet arrived, but if it's okay, we're going to go ahead and begin. Test oh, here he comes. Welcome. I want to welcome our third panel. It's a delight to have both of you here. You're two of our favorite witnesses, uh, Representative Armstrong and uh, Representative Raskin, uh, Ranking Member Raskin, I should say. Mr. Armstrong, we'd welcome your testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Ranking Member McGovern. I urge the Rules Committee to grant a fast and appropriate rule for the House's consideration of H.R. 140, the Protecting Speech from Government Interference Act. During the Oversight and Accountability's February 8th hearing on protecting speech from government interference and social media bias, the Oversight Committee learned how easy and prevalent it has been for the executive branch to violate First Amendment rights and unconstitutionally limit the free exercise of speech on private platforms. At the hearing, we heard hours of witness testimony that re revealed the extent to which exec executive branch employees have repeatedly communicated with private companies to censor and su suppress lawful speech of Americans. Given these examples of violations of the Constitution, I would expect near-unanimous support for my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to pass this legislation. Executive branch employees have publicly and privately coordinated with private sector social media companies to ban specific accounts viewed as politically inconvenient. Under the guise of rooting out alleged misinformation and disinformation, government officials have urged and pressured social media companies to take down tweets, posts, and accounts. However, in almost every case, the executive branch has targeted lawful speech protected under the First Amendment. During our February 8th hearing, we raised questions about emails from FBI agents in the San Francisco field office to Twitter, specifically highlighting that the account activities may pot potentially constitute violations of Twitter's terms of service for any action or inaction deemed appropriate within Twitter policies. These are agents sworn to uphold the Constitution, not Twitter's terms and services. It is inappropriate and dangerous for the executive branch to influence what lawful speech is allowed on private sector platforms. At this same hearing, one of our, the former Twitter employees called for federal legislation that would reasonably and effectively limit government interactions with these private sector platforms. Chairman Comer and I agree. This bill, Perfecting Speech from Government Interference Act, makes this behavior an unlawful activity for federal officials to engage in. If enacted, this bill would subject federal officials to disciplinary actions and monetary penalties if they attempt to censor lawful speech of Americans. Regardless of who is in power, the executive branch should not be able to decide what lawful speech is allowed. We have the First Amendment for a very good reason. The federal judiciary has limited role in interpreting what is and is not lawful under the First Amendment. Federal officials, no matter their rank or resource, should not suppress information or limit the ability of citizens to freely express their views on private sector internet platforms. If any administration feels it is losing the policy argument and the public's confidence in stronger voices, the answer should never be to deploy the resources and power of the federal government to limit constitutionally protected speech of others. H.R. 140 expands the current federal employee political activity limitations of the Hatch Act to include a prohibition on federal employees using their official authority to influence or coerce a private sector internet platform to censor lawful speech. This includes a prohibition on actions that would result in a private sector platform suppressing, restricting, or adding disclaimers or alerts to any lawful speech posted on a platform by a person or entity. I would also like to clarify that H.R. 140 provides explicit exceptions for lawful act actions to carry out legitimate law enforcement functions with specific enumerated functions listed in this act. Additionally, there is a carve out for law enforcement actions not explicitly named under the exception and a rule of construction that clarifies that this act does not prohibit a federal agency from enforcing a federal law or regulation. All of Americans have a right to utilize these new and powerful communication technology resources to share their views and opinions without executive branch putting its thumb on the scale to tilt the debate in one direction. Americans know that the First Amendment protects them from this kind of government censorship and from federal officials who seek to use their positions, influence, and resources to censor lawful speech. The only thing that has changed is that the public square has moved online with powerful new communication tools. We are discussing this legislation today because Americans know that something is wrong and they've asked Congress to fix it. This bill is a targeted first step to address one clear part of the problem, the troubling development that federal officials in the U.S. government 
view it as their role to censor the speech of Americans. Again, I ask the Rules Committee to grant a prompt and appropriate rule for the House's consideration of this legislation, and I welcome your questions. Ranking that member, back. Ranking member Raskin, you're recognized for your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Cole and Mr. McGovern, my friend, Representative Armstrong. Uh, as a former member, I know there's not usually a large global audience for these hearings, but I'm willing to bet that this one is actually a very keen interest to the high-tech agents of Vladimir Putin and uh, Xi Jinping, who are on the edge of their seats right now. This bill is actually a really big deal. H.R. 140 would effectively allow foreign malign actors like Putin and Xi, who've already poured hundreds of millions of dollars into online propaganda to destabilize our democracy, to continue using American social media platforms to wreak havoc on the integrity of our elections. And it would do so by undermining the only defense we've got against their active measure operations, which is the readiness of our national security and intelligence agencies to warn social media platforms and the public about the deployment of counterfeit accounts, disinformation, and cyber surveillance by malign actors determined to sabotage our elections. H.R. 140, which I will call the Putin Protection Act, would put U.S. government security and intelligence officials in a straitjacket, preventing them from directly sharing essential factual information and time-critical intelligence with American social media entities, giving them the chance to block or at least respond to foreign malign operations and disinformation on their own platforms. This bill not only prohibits, as my friend said, but it penalizes information sharing by federal officials with social media entities, except for, quote, law enforcement purposes. And in those few cases, the bill establishes an onerous requirement to submit a lengthy report to Congress and wait 72 hours before acting for all but a few narrow purposes, including child pornography and drug dealing. Now, no one has yet explained why these specific crimes, child pornography and drug dealing, as grave as they are, are more important than the overall national security interests of the United States of America. The bill simply contains no clear exceptions for the defense of our nation's security, such as election security and the security of critical sectors, including our power grid and energy infrastructure, military installations, civilian nuclear infrastructure, and transportation systems. The bill is so poorly written that at best, federal agencies would be forced to navigate a bureaucratic mess and then wait 72 hours before sharing any information about threats related to these critical sectors, 72 hours during which Putin and Xi's lies would be allowed to run free through the cyberspace. At worst, they would be barred from ever sharing information at all if they could not smuggle them under the criminal law enforcement exception. Democrats, Mr. Chairman, acted in good faith to identify and correct this dangerous loophole for our country in committee. We offered an amendment to add a comprehensive national security exception to this baffling ban on information sharing among the government, the people we serve, and the media whose rights we protect. But Republicans voted it down in a dumbfounding party line vote. In stark terms, this means the kleptocrats in Russia, their autocratic allies in communist China, and the theocratic Iranian regime can pump countless millions of dollars into character assassination, hate speech, and election disinformation, including precisely the kind of false information about voting days, poll times, and precinct locations that gave rise to the exact government warnings, which amazingly prompted Chairman Comer to introduce this bill. If you look at the emails they sent that they thought were so provocative and dangerous that they needed this bill, it was coming from intelligence agencies saying, these are the emails where they're putting out false information about when to vote. Our enemies will use our social media as their continuing platform and conduit to pump lies into the bloodstream of America because they will know under this bill that we will have kneecapped our own government officials' power to protect us. This open door policy for our enemies online is a recipe for disaster. Imagine that our agencies receive information that there will be an organized attack on the Capitol 
like the one we saw on January 6, 2021, by foreign or domestic terrorists or insurrectionary groups. Imagine again, it's not hard to do, that social media is saturated with propaganda, disinformation, and logistical planning organized and paid for by such entities. Under this bill, our own officials, whose salaries we pay, would either have no way to communicate this information to us lawfully, or even if they could somehow dress up their national security concerns as law enforcement, they would still have to wait 72 hours behind malign state and political actors. They'd be forced to wait three days for their paperwork to be approved before they could do anything without risking violation of the statute and having their personal names turned over to Congress and being personally punished. In other words, under this bill, the final 72 hours before our presidential election, before the January 6th counting of electoral votes, before the inaugural transfer power will be turned into internet free fire zones for the autocrats and dictators of the world to make trouble for us, just so long as they remember not to mix their deliberate subversion of democracy with their interest in child pornography, which is considered under this bill a more serious danger. Only then could our government get involved. And even if the disinformation arrives mercifully three weeks early, the three-day head start for Putin's team would be impossible to overcome. As Mark Twain once said, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth can get its shoes on. And that was before the internet was invented. What's so demoralizing about this bill, Mr. Chairman, is that Putin's crony capitalist autocracy can never compete with America militarily, economically, philosophically, or diplomatically, but the former KGB chief has zeroed in on the Achilles heel of our country, our vast openness and vulnerability to foreign political subversion and destabilization through the internet. This is a cheap and easy way for regimes that themselves crack down on opposition speech on the internet to inject their poison into the cultural bloodstream of America and turn our people against each other, so much so that members of Congress now call for a national divorce and describe violent insurrectionists who attack our police officers as political prisoners and demand they be pardoned. Meantime, Putin, the former chief of the KGB, has sent dozens of his citizens to prison for tweets that they sent criticizing his regime or his filthy war in Ukraine. And I would urge all of my distinguished former colleagues on the Rules Committee to join a letter that Congresswoman Mace and I are sending demanding the release of all those political prisoners. But rather than fortifying our cyber defenses against Putin, she and the autocrats, this legislation throws open the floodgates and invites them all in. It tells the tyrants to have a field day on the platforms of American cyber ingenuity, and it treats our own officials as enemies of the people. Now, the pretext for this bill is that the FBI somehow colluded with Twitter to suppress the New York Post article on the Hunter Biden laptop, laptop story for all of 24 hours, three full weeks before the presidential election, even as the article was shared all over the internet, all over Fox News and all over New York Post. Twitter's private business decision was private. It was within its First Amendment rights. It had no obligation to link to the article at all, ever. The decision, meantime, was almost immediately reversed. It had no discernible impact on either the spread of the story or on the election. And amazingly, Twitter even apologized for its fleeting editorial decision. In the committee's February 8th hearing on it, the majority's own witnesses debunked the wild and baseless allegations about the US government ordering or colluding with Twitter to censor the New York Post story. That was their decision. The witnesses testified there was no pressure, there was no coercion, there was no undue influence exerted by the FBI or any other government agents whatsoever. Then, of course, Elon Musk proceeded to purchase Twitter, which was totally his right under the First Amendment, under our system of government. He proceeded to cancel and deplatform six fine independent journalists whose coverage of Twitter he didn't like, which again was his right. But none of the Republicans whining about a 24-hour delay in linking to the Hunter Biden laptop story has objected, to my knowledge anyway, in any way to the deplatforming and private censorship of these journalists for their political views, nor have they asked for hearings about this obviously far more sweeping assault on journalistic free speech in America. Why not? If what we care about is private entities censoring private speech. They've also been silent about the shocking and Orwellian corporate censorship being practiced right now by the New York Post itself, 
the Fox News Corporation, Newsmax, and One America News, these outlets are refusing to inform their viewers and readers about the explosive and uncontradicted revelations in court that Fox executives and hosts like Tucker Carlson not only knew full well that Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump were lying about their ridiculous 2020 election claims, but privately called them, quote, insane, absurd, shockingly reckless, and dangerous as hell. These are quotes. And yet still, they credited and they circulated these outlandish conspiracy theories on the air nonetheless, and they now participate in a careful conspiracy of silence about their own complicity with the big lie. They are even shockingly trying to replace the mass of indestructible evidence telling the actual history of what happened on January 6, 2021, when 150 of our police officers were wounded by violent insurrectionists and the vice president of the United States was chased out of the Capitol by a mob calling for his, for his hanging with a few minutes of scattershot lies, pot shots, and distortions. Mr. Chairman, there is no factual basis for this bill. At the hearing, the only evidence we found of federal officials actually trying to coerce Twitter involved Donald Trump, whose feelings got hurt when a celebrity responded to one of his attacks by tweeting that he was a PAB, an acronym that I will not spell out in the interest of decorum today. But Trump then got White House officials to call Twitter and demand that they remove her tweet and remove her account. Again, none of our GOP colleagues has uttered a peep of protest against this clear governmental effort to coerce a social media platform to censor a private person's speech or any of the numerous other examples we found. Perhaps not coincidentally, this bill does not now apply to the President of the United States. Moreover, while this legislation is carefully dra drafted to stop U.S. government officials from handing over any information that might eventually lead to what they're wrongly calling private censorship of Putin and Xi and anti-vaxxers and election deniers, it allows government actors to try to compel speech on Twitter by these very same nefarious actors, indeed, not just on social media, but on all media platforms. But government compelling speech is an equally grievous First Amendment sin to government squelching speech, as my colleague knows. The Supreme Court has made it clear in a whole bunch of cases. West Virginia versus Barnett, the flag salute, the compulsory flag salute case. Woolley versus Maynard, the live free or die on the uh, New Hampshire license plate case. Miami, Miami Herald Publishing versus Tornillo, that the government may not compel private speakers or media entities to carry other people's ideas or the government's own message against their will, against their conscience. And if we really want to claim the act of government simply providing factual information to social media is state censorship, surely this new approach must take an even harder line against government officials acting to compel these entities to include specific speech and speakers on their platforms, a far more serious problem. It should also apply to all forms of media, not just social media, and should cover all elected officials, including us, members of Congress, and presidents, not just federal employees. As I suggested at markup, to move in this direction is a radical step, but it's a totally logical one. I reminded our good chairman just a few days before our hearing, he openly boasted on Newsmax that he had been pressuring AT&T to carry Newsmax on DirecTV, even though AT&T, which I'm pretty sure is still a private corporation, had decided not to enter into a contract with Newsmax solely for business reasons. Chairman Comer stated that he told AT&T to get this resolved satisfactorily to him and other conservatives, quote, or else. These threats were accompanied by a letter to AT&T signed by 42 Republican members of Congress, including Chairman Comer, dangling the prospect of congressional hearings. The letter was so brazen that even the Wall Street Journal denounced it and rejected it as absurd the notion that a business decision based on AT&T's refusal to pay millions of dollars of licensing fees to Newsmax was somehow political discrimination. I would like to submit it for the record if I could. It's called The Rights Wrong Attack on DirecTV over Newsmax. Reading this, blister, this blistering, good. thank you very much. Reading this blistering editorial, you'll see that this political effort at compelling AT&T to enter into a contract for speech it doesn't want to carry is not progress 
for the First Amendment, contrary to what my friend might say, but it is rather egregiously unfair political and financial shakedown. That's what it is. And far from backing down, however, according to Mr. Biggs' statement on Newsmax last week, it appears our committee is now doubling down and is intent on holding hearings about AT&T's private business decision. Now, I don't know what consequences the chairman had in mind when he offered the or else warning, and I would definitely give him and his colleagues the benefit of the doubt. But I do know that this episode comes a lot closer to a real retaliatory threat of government reprisal and discrimination under First Amendment case law as it exists today than the FBI or the NSA turning over objective intelligence information about foreign subversion active operation campaigns against our elections. So the majority should think twice before going down this very serious road. If we do, let's protect all media from both stifled speech and compelled speech, and let's have the rule apply to all government actors, not just executive branch employees. Two of my amendments address some of these glaring flaws, but really, Mr. Chairman, you guys should rethink this whole thing. Compelling social media to carry the propaganda of foreign malign actors and big liars while silencing our government workers and barring them from turning over information about credible threats posed by Russia, China, and other malign forces cannot be the meaning of free speech in the 21st century. I urge all of my distinguished colleagues here to stand with free speech in American democracy and oppose this seriously dangerous bill. I yield back. Chair has no questions at this time. Dr. Burgess is recognized for questions. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank our witnesses for being here and providing us some provocative material. Um, Mr. Armstrong, let me just let me just ask you the uh, since uh, <clears throat> Mr. Raskin brought it up, there was the suppression of a laptop story that occurred in October of 2020. Um, do you think that affected the outcome of the election? Could that be described as election interference? I'm always a little, I, it shouldn't have happened. Whether it actually affected it is, I mean, for people smarter than me to determine. I think the bigger question is, is when you have government agents and specifically law enforcement agents that are reaching out to, the, I mean, we can go through the whole history of that, but I think people want to go home before midnight, but reaching out to private social media companies, not saying, hey, this is illegal. This is violating your own terms and services. And we have those relationships that exist. We have those emails. And it's always, you get into this problem particularly here, and the reason is, is I've spent a lot of time dealing with definitions. I think I'm at least averagely intelligent, I suppose is probably the best way to put it. But I can't define misinformation or disinformation. And the reason you can't define it is because you go to every single social media platform page. They all have a different definition. It's an ambiguous definition that, depending on where you're at and where you're at, you can move into it. And when you utilize their own definitions for, I mean, the real answer is they get it wrong a lot. Well, and I guess that's, that's what bothered me about that story. You had 51 intelligence professionals sign a letter saying, this is Russian disinformation. That was brought up at the presidential debate. And so it was acknowledged that this information we, this is inadmissible because you had 51 intelligence personnel saying this looks to us like something the other side would have produced. And that's where people get so troubled by this, I think. At least that's what I hear about back home. Well, here's what bothers me a lot. I don't know if Twitter knew if it was misinformation or disinformation. I don't know. I, would, I mean, we are investigating that on 51 people. I know who knew it wasn't misinformation. The FBI. They'd had it for a year. They knew that for a fact. Now combine that with the fact that they were communicating on at least a weekly basis under or with so these social media platforms for months, if not years prior to that. And that's where you start drawing, I mean, there's direct evidence and there's circumstantial substantial evidence, Dr. Burgess, and there's a lot of circumstantial evidence here. And I'm just a simple country doctor, so I'll accept your observation. I just wanted, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I want to ask to, since it was brought up about the uh, uh, <clears throat> the whole question of, of, of Newsmax and at and I, I wanted to introduce to the record uh, a letter produced by, by two Democrats on the Energy and Commerce Committee, last Congress, to the CEO of at and uh, complaining about specifically Fox News, OAN, and Newsmax 
And, you know, we just had a big discussion about the origins of COVID, and now we're going to declassify the information, and now we're going to make it all available to people. And one of their gripes was because of people discussing what the origins of COVID were. So I'm going to ask you to ask consent we put this on record as well. And I'll yield back. Distinguished ranking members recognize. Mr. Reskin, did you want to reply to any of that? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. McGovern. Um, first of all, I appreciated Mr. Armstrong's judicious reply. Um, nobody can seriously argue that the the 24-hour failure of Twitter to link to one newspaper story affected the election in any way when it was all over Fox News, it was all over the right-wing media, and it was for one day, three weeks before the election. In any event, Twitter, of course, didn't have any um, compulsion under the First Amendment to run it, to link to it in any way. That was just their decision. And uh, Mr. Musk bought Twitter, so the, the, he's obviously not going to make that mistake again. He sacked six journalists he didn't like. Again, my colleagues aren't complaining about that. That's obviously a diminution in the realm of political free discourse in the society, but they accept that that's the price of the First Amendment. So I don't understand what we're doing here. It just seems kind of silly to me, but we did get to the bottom of it a little bit, uh, Mr. McGovern, at the hearing where we kept hearing about these infamous emails that were written from the FBI, which they felt had coerced or influenced uh, Twitter to do what they did. They finally produced them, and I could see what their tardiness was uh, in producing them because both of them, I'll just read, you know, read them to you. It's from uh, a special agent in San Francisco named Elvis Chan, and he said, um, please see below the list of Twitter accounts, which we believe are violating your terms of service by disseminating false information about the time, place, or manner of the upcoming elections. And this is a classic trick that is done by autocratic governments and people trying to destabilize elections. They say, everybody make sure you go out and vote on Thursday, or everybody make sure um, you, know, you vote next Tuesday, or whatever it is. And so it was that simple thing. This was turned over by the FBI to the social media, say they're using your accounts for it. My God, is there anybody who really would not want paid employees of the federal government to turn over to social media or any media for that matter, information about people who are running false information about when the election is? And my, my good friend says he doesn't, he can't recognize misinformation. Well, I can recognize that as misinformation and disinformation. And I think our government should be notifying the social media and other media if they're being used for the purposes of misleading our people about what day the election is. Mr. Armstrong, um, has the Office of the Director of National Intelligence or any law enforcement or national security mm -hmm. expert in the federal government confirmed that the bill, that this bill would not interfere with vital law enforcement or national security functions? Uh, I've been told the intelligence service has, but that's, uh, it goes to another point where you mentioned child porn and- Well, I uh, didn't mention that. No, but you're talking about specific law enforcement. We what? have a statute, there's statutory construction in the bill that says you can still conduct legal law enforcement. I mean, it's, it's it, well, in the bill. Well, well let, me, let, me, let me go to an amendment that uh, Ms. Escobar of Texas uh, has offered. Uh, maybe you, you'd support this. Uh, uh, basically, it, it would ensure that the bill will not prevent any federal employee from alerting or working with a private entity to re remove manifestos and or live stream videos of mass shooters as well as those of domestic and international terrorist front platforms. And because the way I look at this bill, as it's written, I mean, it, it, this will, will actually help mass shooters and foreign terrorists and their efforts to gain um, infamy and followers, because it requires law enforcement to jump through bureaucratic hoops and a mandatory 72-hour waiting period before even asking that a company like Facebook remove accounts, manifestos, and videos of those of those sorts. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I mean, I, would you support making her amendment in order so we could? I haven't read her amendment, but I can. Well, tell I just you, read you what it, what it well, did. Yeah. The Christian Church shooting got wiped off the internet within 12 hours, all by itself. I mean, you're forgetting there's a whole nother separate group of people here. There's the people who run the platforms. Right. I am. I'm. In so you, you'd be okay with waiting 72 hours um, before removing some of this stuff from platforms? Stuff that, again, could be elevating domestic or international 
terrorists. Well, again, I, mean, I haven't seen the amendment, but I would want to do, look at it compared to the rule of construction. Yeah, well, the, the, the amendment was submitted on time, so it's not a late amendment. Um, I'm sure your staff is familiar with the amendment. I'm just curious. I mean, would, would, I mean so, these are some of the concerns that are being raised about maybe the unintentional, unintentional consequences of this bill. But, um, you know, um, it, you know, I, I, so I'm just curious. I mean, Mr. Raskin, do you have any? But I got to say, Mr. McGovern, I think it's extraordinary that we're even discussing this. I mean, why do we have an FBI and an S NSA? And why do we have the intelligence agencies if we're not going to use the intelligence that they gather to inform the security of the country? No. So obviously, I would support that. In general, we need a catch-all national security exception because my, my friend, Mr. Armstrong, is right that there's this, there are these narrowly defined law enforcement exceptions for drug dealing and child pornography, which I take very seriously, but I don't see um, why those are more grave than the national security interests of the whole country. Would, 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 would any of you disagree with the fact that Putin has actively tried to influence um, American public opinion by exploiting uh, some of these platforms? That, that's just a matter of fact, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Bipartisan Intelligence Senate Committee report determined he did it. His internet research agency has spent hundreds of millions of dollars doing it. 17 national security agencies have agreed that they interfered in the 2016 election. I don't think that's a matter of dispute. But and, 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 uh, Do you dispute that, Mr. Armstrong? No, I think yeah. they, I mean, they're involved in misinformation, not just Russia, by the way. There's lots of people that are involved. And so I'm just trying to think of like, so if a federal a bureaucrat in a federal agency were to call Twitter or to call Facebook um, and, to, and to basically highlight the fact that, you know, what is being posted on their platform is direct Russian propaganda. Is that? They're treating it as a violation of the Hatch Act. That person's name will be reported to Congress and that person can be fined, I mean, I think it's 10,000, 15, 20,000, depending on the number of offenses. They want to take those people to court. They want to shut that down. I mean, this is why it's just unfathomable to me what we're talking about. I mean, I, I guess, why wouldn't we want our federal government to inform us whether or not something that is being put out there is Russian propaganda? Is there any, I mean, why, why, why is that a bad thing? The domestic and foreign terrorism part of this bill is the determined and dealing with this. And there are normal law enforcement functions. You are allowed to do this for law enforcement functions. What you are not allowed to do is to utilize either domestic or foreign terrorism as an excuse to censor American speech. Yeah, I mean, but Russia propaganda doesn't, I mean, necessarily have to like technically be against the law or violating something that would fall under you know, an anti-terrorist statute, right? I mean, I, I mean, it's something, you know, as, as Mr. Raskin pointed out, of, of, of giving the wrong information about when an, the election is. So after the 2016 election, Twitter stood up their entire program called Project Vigilance. They are doing this. They have a, they have a responsibility to do this on their own. The problem is, is with the government coming involved and in doing this, you capture too much, you too much free speech on the back end of this. And just to be quite frank, they get it wrong a lot. Either best case scenario is they get it wrong by accident, or worst case scenario is they get it wrong and they don't care. Well, this is all very disturbing, Mr. Raskin. Well, but I would just say to Mr. Armstrong, who I got to serve with in the Judiciary Committee, he knows the First Amendment really well. And if there's a First Amendment violation, then sue the government. The government's actually coercing people's speech, compelling speech, or violating people's speech, fine. But what we're talking about is the provision of factual information. Right. And that has never been deemed to be a First Amendment violation. It's totally, at that point, within the realm of Twitter, which in the old days might have run the stuff about, oh, these were false accounts under Elon Musk. They might not want to run it. The New York Post might not want to run it. Maybe the New York Times would want to run it. But it, it's up to the different media entities themselves. Mr. Raskin, can you discuss the compelled speech aspect of your amendment, number 34? Um, it says, I understand there was some question about germaneness. So um, this is a really important point. Thank you for raising it, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, their bill says basically <clears throat> that the government should not be in the business of giving people information if it could lead to those people being taken taken down. Like say Putin is running some false information about when our elections are in Texas or something. Um, and if it would lead to being taken down, you can't do it. But what happens if you have a different administration and then they tell Twitter, you must restore Donald Trump to his account? Or we will, we're gonna try to pressure you or coerce you into doing that. That would be perfectly lawful within this bill. In other words, you, the, the government employees cannot try to get something removed from Twitter, but they can force Twitter to restore, you, you name it, um, somebody who's been taken off for spreading disinformation about public health, someone who's been forced to take down for spreading racist or anti-Semitic speech, what have you. And all I'm saying is, if we're gonna get in the business of controlling what the government does in order to prevent any interference with free speech on internet platforms, the government should not be allowed to try to get people taken off platforms or should not be allowed to force anybody to be put on a platform. And the basis for that is within the First Amendment itself, because the Supreme Court has repeatedly held that compelling speech is just as much of a constitutional sin as forbidding speech. Um, and you know that, in, you know, certainly my conservative friends understand it from all the cases which have said, you can't compel people to pay union dues for ideological purposes they don't want. And they've won on all those, where the Supreme Court says, yeah, you can, you can ask people to be paid in order to represent them for negotiations, but their money can't go for ideological purposes that they don't want. And they are the big champions of that idea that there can be no compelled speech under the First Amendment. Yeah, I, I think we're going down a very dangerous road here. Um, and there are lots of maybe in, unintended consequences. Maybe some of the consequences are intended by the authors of this bill. Um, but uh, Mr. Armstrong, I didn't hear it. it maybe I missed it in, in, the, in your opening. You know, there have been a number of amendments that have been um, offered to this bill. Uh, are, are you uh, advocating that they be made in order, or, or are you? Uh, what is your opinion of allowing some members who have some, I think, some real concerns here, uh, you know, uh, to be able to offer their amendments? How you all determine to write the rule is the purview of the rules committee, and I will abide by whatever you want. Yeah. It, although the, your predecessor came up here very clearly and said he wanted a close rule um, on the pre, on the previous bill, so I mean that pe people are free. This well, you know we, you don't have a limit of freedom of speech in the rules committee. Um, you can say whatever whatever you believe. I mean, I I just said there were there were lots of amendments um, that have been offered that I think uh, that are germane um, that I think are um, you know should be heard. But uh, so, I, just, I would just. I do, what I would say to this, and this will go to the compelled 230 speech and all of those different things, right. there are a lot of different conversations. I served on the antitrust committee. I'm on the, I don't know what the new name is, but the Consumer Protection Committee on Energy and Commerce. There are tons of different issues with this. This is limited specifically to the Hatch Act and specifically to what is in oversight jurisdiction. Uh, you, when you start going down into the compelled speech, 230 roles, all of those things, you're bringing in energy and commerce, you're bringing antitrust, you're bringing in things that are outside the purview of the oversight jurisdiction. Well, and maybe they should have been brought in, you know, before the bill came to the rules committee, <clears throat> Mr. Braskin. Well, it just, if my friend is making a point about germaneness, I'm afraid they've already crossed that bridge because the way that they've written their provision is you can't force speech to be taken or you can't influence them to take speech off, nor can you influence um, Twitter or other social media entities to put on any kind of tag or disclaimer. That is compelled speech. So they've already opened the door to compelled speech. And what I'm saying is, if we're going to ban compelled speech, let's do it entirely. Well, I agree with you. And I hope that, I, I hope that you know, that uh, the rule reflects uh, that fact and that, um, and that some of the real serious concerns that have been raised uh, get a chance to be aired on the House floor. But I thank you both for being here. But I, again, I think this is a very, very dangerous road uh, for us to go down. Mr. Cole. You, you may Chairman want to respond Cole. to this. Yeah. I'm just going to, just for the purpose of clarification, in the last witness that asked for a closed rule, that was the CRA. Yeah, so well, that's normally done by right, both but, sides. But, there, but there's nothing, but nothing in. Let me right. this is perfectly appropriate for anybody right. to come here and request any kind of rule right. they want. Uh, yeah. And by the way, there's nothing that says that a CRA has to be a closed rule. No, but you've right. always done it that yeah, way. So, uh, always uh, got it that uh, way. Just, uh, anyway, 
but uh, I just wanted to point out that some people do come before here and ask for amendments to be made in order. And, nothing, uh, nothing, and again, yeah, my yeah. friend's point, nothing wrong with that. All right. All right. Well, I, I, have, I have no further questions. General lady from uh, Minnesota is recognized for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I guess I wish uh, Mr. McGovern and the Democrats had been so concerned about amendments uh, when they were in the majority um, because it was difficult to get amendments made in order. Yeah, we made thousands of amendments in order. Uh, were they Democrats or Republicans? And, and many on this committee, I should add. Reclaiming my time. But I, because I, that wasn't what I saw. But, um, but I just wanted to um, ask. Uh, Mr. Armstrong about, I know that the Republicans, you know, there's there's been a lot of talk about making, you know, being very concerned about making law enforcement in order and, and are we going to be stifling free speech, all kinds of things like that. I understand that you went through, the Republicans went through a lot of um, conversation and uh, concern to make sure that this bill did what it was supposed to do and that it wasn't going to do those things that are being talked about now. And I'm wondering if you would be, if you want to talk a little bit about the kinds of things you went through to get it to this place. Yeah, I mean, so we've had meetings, like I said, uh, home, or, uh, but we went through all of these different things. There's a rule of construction specifically excluding legitimate law enforcement activities. The reason drug trafficking, human trafficking, and child pornography are listed is so they're exempt from the reporting requirement, but they're not exclusive. They're not exhaustive. The problem, you, we run through all of this, we did tons of things, we open uh, committee process, hearings, markup, the whole uh, part of that. And I th again, when we're talking about what we're dealing with, uh, platforms can take down whatever they want, they can put disclaimers on whatever they want. They can do all of those different things. The President of the United States or somebody can go up to a podium and say whatever they want. The problem is something that should be protected by First Amendment activity can't get backdoored around it through different conversations on the back end. And this is, I mean, when we're talking about compelled speech and all of this, this is very specifically limited to oversight jurisdiction of the Hatch Act. And it's independent of all the conversations on ESC. It's nothing that we would ever come to an agreement on. Bipartisan 230 reform, partisan 230 reform, Senate 230 reform, House 230 reform, none of that will end up affecting this bill. This bill operates independently of all of those things. And Mr. Armstrong, this, this bill went through all regular order. Yes. There was plenty of opportunity to discuss, talk about that. Okay. All right. Thank you. And with that, I yield back. The lady from Pennsylvania is recognized for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this has some echoes of some of our judiciary hearings, I think. Uh, over the past several years, it's become an article of faith among some of the loudest MAGA Republicans that their so-called conservative speech is being silenced and that grievance seems to have led to this bill. Those conservatives have offered no evidence for their claim that they've been disproportionately targeted for their political views on social media. Instead, independent study has shown that conservative voices actually have occupied more space on social media than liberal voices. And furthermore, to the extent that social media has in recent years suspended Republican users more frequently than Democrats, another independent empirical study of this bias claim found that this disparity was not the result of partisan favoritism, but because those MAGA Republicans were more likely to spread misinformation that violated the terms of use of the social media companies and at times even the First Amendment including spreading conspiracy theories, lies, hate speech, and foreign propaganda that's damaging to our national security and public safety. So I'd ask unanimous consent to introduce an article from The Hill referencing these studies uh, entitled, Musk Says Twitter is Biased Against Conservatives, Facts Say Otherwise. Is that unanimous consent? Without objection. Thank you. So here we are again, a couple months into the 118th Congress with another MAGA messaging bill to cater to the far right Republican base and the Russian trolls that feed off their grievances. But it doesn't do anything to help Americans with their real problems. These bills lead one to question whether House Republicans have any interest in governing. They aren't offering solutions to inflation, the cost of living, or health care. They haven't produced policies to grow the economy, create jobs, or keep our communities safe. Some have shown themselves unwilling to protect democracy, whether here at home or abroad. So I guess we're just going to have to keep waiting for the chance to work 
with our colleagues across the aisle to craft some legislation to address the issues that Americans are actually addressing. Mr. Raskin, you've spoken about the fact that this bill only creates explicit exceptions for drug and human trafficking, child porn, and you offered some amendments to address um, some of the things that are overlooked, such as insurrections and attacks on the Capitol. Rep. Schiff, um, Representative Schiff offered an amendment that talked about um, creating ex or making explicit exceptions um, for combating terrorism, incitement of violence, acts of insurrection, domestic terrorism, um, including hate, homophobia, transphobia, and anti-Semitism. Could you comment on that? Well, obviously all that is right. I mean, of course, that is the exception that will swallow the rule. I mean, the other way that you accomplish the exact same purpose is you just reject the bill, which makes no sense. I mean, it, I'm sure it does make sense to Vladimir Putin and to President Xi and the other autocrats around the world and those people who, um, you know, are thinking that this is going to help them, for example, keep somebody on a platform if they're spreading disinformation about a public health crisis. Um, so obviously we need that. If we're going to go down this road, let's write it in a way where we can protect the national security interests of the country. We can protect ourselves against terrorism. We can protect ourselves against insurrection. We can protect ourselves against subversion and so on. But otherwise, I just don't understand it. It's like we're handcuffing our own government in terms of being able to warn us about the threats to the country. And like I said, Putin's got nothing on us. We beat him militarily. We beat him economically. We beat him philosophically. We beat him politically in terms of our, our ideas. But what has he got? He's very smart. He basically created a Manhattan Project for internet subversion because we're an open society. And while he's throwing people in jail for sending tweets seven years ago criticizing his regime, we're allowing them to come in and spread all their propaganda and disinformation. And now we got a bill saying we're going to punish our own federal government employees if they let social media know about what he's doing. I mean, to me, it's just incalculably stupid what's being proposed here. OK, and in the interest of preserving some regular order, and I think I'm coming up on five minutes, I'll yield back. God bless you. A uh, gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for question. Thank the chairman. Um, I mean, the federal government thinks they've found some tremendous loophole. They, and they've got lawyers who've erected this really shaky scaffolding, scaffolding of, of, of a legal framework. The problem is so much of what they're doing is supposedly legal, but it's not constitutional. Once you've done a... Once you've taken all of these steps that they have taken, it's not constitutional. That's what we're wrestling with. I, the Twitter files are abhorrent. Thank goodness that Elon Musk bought this company and released this stuff. He, um, and, I, and I think it really disturbs a majority of Americans to think that they're federal government agents whether they're at the FBI or the CDC, sitting around watching social media posts, individual users, social media posts. Like, when did Congress ever direct the CDC or the FBI to become the police of social media? Not for things that are illegal, but for things that they may decide they don't want other American people to hear because it goes against the narrative that the government is putting out there. So now anything that goes against the government narrative on vaccines, on treatments for COVID, on the election, anything that goes against what the government wants you to hear is disinformation. This is the problem. Who defines disinformation? They got it wrong. Whoever was defining it for Hunter Biden's laptop sure as hell got it wrong. That wasn't disinformation. So, um, and, and by the way, it's not their job to sit there. I mean, how many, what, what level of appropriation did we appropriate to the FBI to go uh, be the Facebook police force to sit there and watch uh, individuals, users posts to see what they're putting out in this wrong? What might be a legitimate function of the government 
is to look at that, try to notice trends, and then to put out their own view of the thing, not to go, I mean, the FBI has a Facebook page, CDC has a Twitter account. They regularly get ratioed for the ridiculousness they put on social media. It's so, it's so ridiculous. Most social media users don't believe most of it. Go look at the CDC's account. That's their outlet for controlling the narrative. Also, the CDC has spent hundreds of millions of dollars. We, we appropriated a billion dollars for them to advertise, to promote the vaccines. We did. In a, in a congressional bill, we gave them a billion dollars. Here, go promote the vaccines. We didn't give them a billion dollars to say, go work with social media companies to try and ban users who say things that you don't like. But that is what they're doing. When you, you cross a line, when you name when the government names individual users, when they send spreadsheets over to social media companies, and, or when the White House specifically does this and say, says, please, I think you should ban these people. It doesn't matter that it's a, a, a term of service. Those are, those are private contracts. It is not up to the federal government to enforce these private contracts. It, and the American people know this. I mean, I'm not gonna kid myself. There aren't too many American people watching a rules committee right now. But when this gets to the floor, they'll watch that debate and they're gonna, Frankly, they're not going to be able to follow some of these ridiculous arguments about compelled speech and that uh, because when when they go read the bill and see that it doesn't really do what some people on the other side of the aisle are saying it does. So, I mean, I, it's, a, it's unfortunate that this bill is necessary. I don't know why the FBI or the CDC thought it was their mission to police social media accounts for things that they didn't like. But uh, now that I've finished that, let me just say, Mr. Armstrong, I don't think your bill goes far enough. I mean, a thousand bucks and the loophole in here uh, that the, the other side it says isn't that isn't big enough. They they clearly haven't talked to some lawyers at the White House that will take, you give them an inch and they'll create 20 miles of, of uh, slack. They're, they're salivating at these uh, loopholes. I mean, because again, they, they have an army of lawyers who don't worry about the constitutionality of things, they worry about the legality of those things. And I know it sounds like a conflict to say that something is legal, but it's not constitutional, but we do that. We pass bills that uh, ostensibly are legal since we've passed them, but they're not constitutional. And the same thing uh, happens with regulatory framework, the administrative law, a lot of that is not constitutional. I mean, it, it regularly gets stricken by the Supreme Court. Like, it's not something that happens occasionally or randomly or once in a blue moon. It happens all the time. So uh, I'm just concerned. I hope, I hope some of the amendments that have been offered pass. Uh, the American people are relying on us. And when we name a bill and we, said a, says a, we say a bill does something, we lose, we've actually lost a lot of credibility by passing bills like the Inflation Reduction Act that have nothing to do with inflation. Now, this bill does have something to do with the thing it says it's going to cure, but I think it needs to be a little bit stronger. And so uh, without speaking to any particular amendment, let me just say I hope some of the amendments are, uh, are I, I would be in favor of allowing some of them, and I hope they do pass to strengthen this bill because the American people are appalled at what they've seen in the Twitter files. The, Twitter is so small compared to the number of people it touches uh, with respect to the number of people it touches compared to Facebook, that I think probably what we don't know, which is going on at Facebook, is probably much pervasive and much worse because it's not been exposed. So why would anybody change what they're doing? And let me just close on this and say, the First Amendment doesn't protect your right to say things the government approves of. The First Amendment 
protects your right to, to say things as long as you are not causing immediate and, and direct harm to somebody with what you're saying. You have the right to say conspiracy theories. Thank God, because so much of what's been labeled a conspiracy theory, like uh, natural immunity, oh, well, that was a thing until the vaccines came out, and then it was a conspiracy will theory. The, will the gentleman yield? Uh, if you want to talk about natural immunity, I'll yield. Uh, uh, no, I don't. I want, okay, I want to thank you. The bill reclaiming. And, 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 yeah, because no one's... No one's I'll, I'll yield to you. Yeah, nobody is suggesting that you don't have the right to utter conspiracy theories. Okay. Indeed, if everybody... There's I, lots of that here. The, the issue here is whether or not um, it is appropriate for somebody to point out to somebody that, in fact, you know, what you are uttering is Russian propaganda or what you are uttering is... It's, you let know, me reclaim it. Let me, be, let me engage. Could end up inciting violence. Instead That's of, it. Instead you of, don't have to take it. You don't have to. Instead of shutting you down, let me engage you and, okay, and throw something out there. If if there's if there's something the government deems to be Russian propaganda about, let's say casualty numbers in Ukraine, and a U.S. citizen copies it from you can say it copies it from the Russian website, you can do it. puts it on their website, and right. publishes it. Is that a problem? I, I, you can do it. I'm not, but right. And the issue is, there's, but the federal government is not saying to these social media um, outlets that you have to take it down. They're just merely pointing okay. out. And that this you is where we... Yeah, so that is that is the difference. This here. is where we you get. Can, you can continue to utter conspiracy theories yeah. about, you know, vaccines. I, I will, because else. they end up being like, true about two years later. Uh, the problem with saying that nobody forced anybody to do anything is the CDC spent a billion dollars promoting the vaccines, and a lot of that went to these companies. We also know from the Twitter files that Twitter elected to take money from the FBI. Now, once you're on the dole and somebody, I wish this worked better with children, you know, between adults and children, you know, you like to say, hey, I'm paying for your car and you need to drive the speed limit, but that's, that's children and adults. But with the FBI, once, once they start paying social media companies, with the CDC, once they start paying social media companies, then we can see, we can see from the Twitter files that those companies start bending over backwards. They create portals, special portals for the U.S. government to have their cases come before the social media company and get a special adjudication. You don't call, if you're the government, you don't call customer support line. Hell no, you're not gonna do that. We've given, uh, you know, the government, the executive branch, authorized by Congress, given hundreds of millions of dollars to these companies. They're not gonna say, oh, take a number, call customer support. So this is the problem that we're constructively, by taking a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and, and some from here and some from there, the federal government is violating the First Amendment rights of people. It's happening. You can sit here and deny it. I, I wish the, uh, the, more of the amendments from the other side of the aisle were offered in good faith to make a better bill because there definitely needs to be a bill uh, and it's sad that it does, but we've allowed through authorizations and the money we've given these agencies uh, and by just neglect of oversight, we've allowed them to evolve this model where they can just basically shut people down on social media. And it's the government doing it, using the money that Congress has authorized and using the relationships and by trying to creatively uh, encourage the social media companies to apply terms of service, which, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that the government can't get on social media and have their own platform, have their own user account and put out their narrative. That's the way it should be. There should, if there should be any disclaimer on social media, it should be, this is a US government narrative. That is one disclaimer I would be in favor of putting on social media. Because more often than not, they get it wrong, but you should know when your taxpayer dollars are being used to influence what you think and what you believe. So uh, with 
some of the concerns about enforceability addressed with some of the amendments that would strengthen it, I would support this bill and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlelady from New Mexico is recognized for questions. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chair um, and, and, and Ranking Member for your presentations. Um, you know, it strikes me that there's been this conversation with regards to free speech, and as you pointed out, uh, Ranking Member, if there is a free speech violation, you can sue the government, right? That is actually already available. Free speech is protected. What we're talking about here is protecting people uh, by allowing by allowing those we employ and hire and train to inform social media about lies, right? Well, what's disinformation? It's a lie, right? We, we, sometimes we don't just get to it. It's a lie that is meant to influence your behavior in a particular way, right? That's why when they don't, when they come out and tell you, you need to go vote on Wednesday when the voting day is Tuesday. That is a classic example of disinformation. Uh, uh, ranking member, would you like to respond to uh, any of these issues on that? Um, I would. I always learn a lot from listening to Mr. Massey, and I wanted to um, raise two points with him about his provocative questions. Um, one is that uh, as much as he may not like it, the publication of neutral, objective, factual information by the FBI is a revolutionary transformation in the work of the FBI, if you're willing to look at it historically. And I want to recommend a great new book that's out for you to read, Mr. Massey, called G-Man, uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the Making of the American Century by a, a Yale professor, history professor named Beverly Gage. But in it, you will find that the FBI was engaged not just in publishing negative information by, that would, be, that would have been the least of it, but active disinformation campaigns, subversion campaigns, wiretapping against the civil rights movement, against Dr. Martin Luther King, in the COINTELPRO movement, against the Vietnam War movement, against uh, Malcolm X, um, in the Palmer raids back in the 1920s and 30s. And I must say, your right-wing forebears were all completely for J. Edgar Hoover doing that doing things far more extreme and sweeping than anything the FBI has even been accused of by your side today, like publishing neutral factual information about what Vladimir Putin is doing. So the moment that I hear you denounce that sordid history, the, that's the moment I can start to take a little bit more seriously what you're saying about the publication of factual information. The second point I want to make in response um, to you, um, my dear colleague, uh, is about lying. because. Um, there is an unfortunate uh, agnosticism being expressed by some of our colleagues about disinformation and lying, as if we don't know the difference within our legal system between what's truth and what's lies. I mean, and I suppose that's the importance of the Dominion Voting Systems case right now against Fox News, where you had Tucker Carlson and all of these right-wing commentators saying behind the scenes that this was all nonsense, it was foolishness, it was ridiculous, of course, Trump lost the election. Uh, Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani are out to lunch. These are, these are not exact quotes, but they are um, a fair approximation of the kinds of things they were saying. Um, and then they would go out on TV and they would continue to circulate and promote those lies. And they refuse to report on it now to the millions of people that they lied to during the election. Now, <clears throat> the Dominion Voting Systems is suing them for more than a billion dollars because they were defamed because they said that Dominion Voting Systems was part of this imaginary conspiracy to fix the election. That cost them real money. Now, I wonder if any of my colleagues would say we should not have lies against, we should not have laws against commercial lies like that. We should not have laws against libel and defamation. Perhaps that's Mr. Massey's argument that we must be completely agnostic under the First Amendment, and we should not have any defamation law or libel law at all. But if we believe that there's a difference between truth and lies, then we should accept that under our system of government. And I would hope that we would hold every government official and employee to the highest levels of truth and accountability, which is why I supported the church investigation against COINTELPRO, at least retroactively. I was a kid when it happened. But I supported efforts by Congress to demand that people in government tell the truth. That's got to have real meaning. 
Thank you for your and, question. And it strikes me that what we're trying to do is make sure that we, when we have the truth, when we have factual information, mm -hmm. uh, that we want to make sure that we pass that on to those who can act. It's their decision whether they act or not. But what we're trying to do is make sure that we are allowed to pass on that information. Is that correct? Well, like I said, if, if Russia wants to publish um, false information about voting times and days in every state in the union, or at least the swing states, because they're at that level of sophistication now in their internet research agency, the New York Post might decide to completely ignore it, and the New York Times might decide to write an article about it. It's going to be up to the private entities themselves, and nobody has laid a glove on our finding that there was no coercion and there was no, pr no pressure at all by any federal government agent to do this. And again, I, I wish just one of my colleagues would say Donald Trump really should not have gotten the White House to try to take, take down the private tweets put up that he didn't like. I've not heard one say that. And yet that's the only example that we got during our February 8th hearing of a government official actually using the government to try to coerce Twitter to take down something that he didn't like. So the only example was actually President Trump, a Republican president, trying to take down he personally did not like. It wasn't about a factual. There are multiple examples like that. And again, nobody's protested about it. I don't see what it would cost them just to say, you know what, he really shouldn't be doing that. that was but wrong. they won't. And that kind of is reflective of the way that this is an exercise in sycophancy more than it is in really trying to figure out the law. So, and I want to uh, echo my colleagues, uh, Representative Scanlon's report uh, notion that, you know, the social media companies are biased against conservatives. And uh, I would uh, request uh, 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 that I want to submit the report from the New York University, uh, which found that the idea of anti conservative bias by social media platforms is, quote, a falsehood with no reliable evidence to support it. Without objection. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, I really do uh, want to, uh, and, and uh, Representative, uh, I did elevate you to chair. I don't know if you have any intent of ever serving in that role. <laughs> but would you agree that, that there is a problem with regards to uh, the manner in which Russia uh, uh, actively engages in uh, putting, in, in our social media and in, in, in attempting to sway public opinion. Do you, do you actually agree that that happens? I think a lot of foreign countries use a lot of different tools to actively engage in all of these things, but foreign governments and foreign agents aren't covered by the First Amendment. I mean, they're just but, not. But, but what this right. is about is this is about allowing our agencies to, in, to, uh, to inform and to provide information to uh, private companies that they might not, we might have that information, and they might not. And we want to be able to alert private companies about that, uh, a ranking member. Well, I agree completely with what Mr. Armstrong just said. Vladimir Putin and President Xi don't have First Amendment rights to invade our electoral system. So why would we give them those rights? Yeah. That's what this bill is all about. Yeah, I think that's why you're calling it the Putin Protection Act, because we are, we are protecting them by... Uh, uh, by hampering our own ability to provide the information. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentle lady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you, sir. Gentleman has no questions. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy. Uh, thank the gentleman. I'll try to keep it short. We've got votes coming up. Um, <clears throat> look, I, I would only point out here, and uh, there's been a lot of back and forth, and the gentleman from Maryland has talked about seeking truth. And at the, at the core of this whole thing and everything we do, it's just like, who gets to decide what's true? And how much power does the government have to go police what's true and then do something about it? That's the question. And if, if, if people think Fox News or MSNBC or, or CNN or anybody else are engaged in misinformation, disinformation, whatever the word of the day is, that no one even knows what the hell the difference is, and they start you say, oh, well, they're saying stuff's not true. And say, well, then turn the damn thing off. And watch the one you want. Let the market sort it out. Uh, if somebody's saying stuff on Twitter. But when we've got things like, well, you know, the, uh, um, we had the, um, where is this stuff here? Um, the, 
we had well we had situations where um, in July of 21 Biden accused social media companies of killing people for not stamping out quote misinformation surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic four hours later Alex Berenson an outspoken critic of the COVID-19 response was kicked off Twitter I'm not going to sit here and go through all sorts of things. I could sit here for a long time and long lists of these kinds of things. The concern uh, about this entire subject is the government, the government deciding what is true or not true and then acting on it. That is the concern. We can debate the, the, the merits of the law. My friend from Kentucky said it should go further. We should have different kinds of penalties. Uh, maybe we should have some different language. I think there's some amendments we should consider, as he mentioned. Um, all I just want to just say is that the reason we're here is because of that. And with that, I yield back for time's sake. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Indiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Armstrong, I just wanted to ask, given the, the testimony or comments you've heard, do you have anything else you want to add uh, with respect to this bill? Well, I would just add to what Representative Roy just said. There's more to it than that because private social media companies take down constitutionally protected speech all the time. And every one of them has terms and services to do that. The problem is, and from when Mr. Raskin's talking about Hoover and the civil rights movement, if Twitter would have existed then, they would have done it then too. It's a, I'm an equal opportunist when it comes to the lack of censorship. I'm a First Amendment absolutist. I don't care who it is. But the problem you're running into is they're using they're, these people, all of these things are constitutionally protected from U.S. citizens. I mean, we, when we speak about the First Amendment, and I've heard it in, I don't know, 25 different hearings since I've been in Congress, we fail to talk about the imminence requirement of lawless activity. There's an imminence requirement to lawless activity. Disinformation, misinformation, bigotry, all of those different things are already taken down under almost every single terms and service. That's okay. It should be. That's private sector. But when you're using government government agents and government cooperation and government money, as Representative Massey pointed out, to enforce those terms and services, which are significantly more restrictive than the First Amendment, is where we end up having a problem. And just to be clear on the difference between Fox News and Twitter and Facebook and all of that, I'm going to boil it down real simple. It's Section 230. They're getting sued. They're in court right now. Whether you agree with the lawsuit, disagree with the lawsuit, think it's going to win, think it's not going to win, they are getting sued right now in court. We have, we have created an entire federal regime to shield all of these companies from liability in these situations. And when you talk about whether somebody knows and they can sue the government, that's fine so far as it goes. But if a government agent is reaching out to a person who works at any social media company and quietly having them take something constitutionally protected speech down that may or may not be a violation of their own terms and services, and there's no liability to go after that company, how are you ever going to know if the government did it? How are you ever going to? The First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, equal opportunity, they're all messy. But if you take an oath to uphold the Constitution, you can't end run that Constitution by going to companies and asking them to take things down for their own terms and services. And I just... And, that's what we're trying to stop. I think Congressman Massey pointed out there are a whole lot of stuff that was taken down at the beginning of COVID for a lot of different reasons that three and a half years later now we're looking at. And that's before you get into peer-reviewed studies and all of these other things. So thank, thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Are there any other questions for our witnesses? Thank you for coming, seeing none. Thank you for coming today. The witnesses are excused. Mr. Chair, I, I just want to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record a statement from Representative Jackson Lee on her amendment number 55 to H.R. 140 and a statement from Representative Takano on his amendment number 39 to Representative to H.R. 140. Without objection. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I want to ask for unanimous consent as well. I've, I know it was discussed that um, the Hunter laptop story did not affect the results of the election. Rasmussen would say otherwise. I've got an uh, article talking about the polling on this and that 20% of Biden voters did not know about this. They, they would have changed their mind. That actually would have affected the results in swing states, such as my home state of Pennsylvania. So I'd like to enter the text of this into the record. 
It's not objection, so ordered. Thank you. Particularly because it agrees with the point I was making. Are there any other witnesses wishing to testify on HR 140? Seeing none, uh, we'll close the hearing portion. And committee stands. Uh, recess up to the call of the chair, and members are advised not to leave. Oh, okay. okay. So, what do you, what do you think? Oh, okay, so we'll... we'll, we'll, we'll.
sorry. Thank you. The chair will uh, be in receipt of a motion from the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 140, the Protecting Speech from Government Interference Act, a structured rule. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on oversight and accountability or their respective designees. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 140 made in order as original text. The rule further makes in order only those amendments printed in the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. All points of order against the amendments are waived. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for consideration of H.J. Res. 27, providing for congressional disapproval under Chapter 8 of Title V, United States Code of the rules submitted by the Department of, Department of the Army, Corps of Engineers, Department of Defense, and the Environmental Protection Agency related to revised definition of waters of the United States under a closed rule. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the joint resolution. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on transportation and infrastructure or their respective designees. The rule provides that the joint resolution shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the joint resolution. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for consideration of Senate 619, the COVID-19 Origin Act of 2023, under a closed rule, the rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence or their respective designees. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. Section 4 of the rule provides that Section 7 of the War Powers Resolution 50 U.S.C. Uh, 1546 shall not apply to a concurrent resolution introduced during the first session of the 118th Congress pursuant to Section 5 of the War Powers Resolution, 50 U.S.C. 1544, with respect to Syria. Finally, Section 5 provides that if a veto message is laid before the House on House Joint Resolution 30, then after the message is read and the objections of the President are spread at large upon the journal, further consideration of the veto message, and the joint resolution shall be postponed until the legislative day of March 23rd, 2023. And on that legislative day, the House shall proceed to the constitutional question of reconsideration and dispose of such question without intervening motion. Thank you very much. You've now heard the motions. Are there any discussion or amendment yeah, to the rule? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, we'll, right we'll try to be quick here, but let me just first say that um, we're a little disappointed with the breakdown of the amendments uh, that were made in order. Um, 50% of the 18 amendments submitted by Republicans were made in order for Democrats, 2%. Only one amendment was made in order out of 44 <laughs> submitted by Democrats. Um, in fact, in this, there are more closed rules in this rule than there are Democratic amendments made in order. Uh, but I just wanted to make that point. We have a, a, a few amendments. I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee make an order amendment number 33 to H.R. 140 offered by Representative Escobar which would ensure that the bill will not prevent any federal employee from alerting or working with a private entity to remove manifestos and or live stream videos of mass shooters, as well as those of domestic and international terrorists from platforms. Is there any uh, discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, hearing none, the question is uh, on the amendment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. As for roll call, Mr. Chairman. Uh, roll call has been requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Votes no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Yeah. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose. 
Ms. Leisure Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report. Three yeas, nine nays. The amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I have another amendment to the rule. I move Gentlemen's the recognized. committee make an order amendment number 46 to H.R. 140 offered by myself, which would ensure that nothing in this act will prohibit a federal employee from advocating against the banning of books, specifically books on topics such as communities of color, the history of slavery and or racism in the United States, and books with LGBTQI characters. Uh, it is my amendment simple. Uh, it just makes clear that uh, you know that nothing will prohibit a, a federal employee from um, uh, advocating against uh, the banning of these materials. Is there any further discussion of the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 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 Opinion of the chair. The noes have it. I ask for roll call vote on that. Uh, roll call has been requested. Clerk will uh, call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Yes, Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy, no. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose, Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, Perfect no. Tally. Three yeas, nine nays. Amendments uh, not agreed to. Any additional amendments? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. Can the ladies recognize. I move the committee make an order amendment number 30 to HR 140 offered by Representative Schiff, which would make explicit additional exceptions for employees engaged in lawful actions within their official capacity for the purpose of exercising legitimate law enforcement functions regarding activities to combat terrorism, incitement of violence, and acts of insurrection. Acts of terrorism include acts of domestic terrorism motivated by, motivated by all forms of bigotry including anti-AAPI hate, homophobia and transphobia, anti-Semitism, and white nationalism. Uh, we need to make, ensure, make sure that law enforcement and members of the intelligence community are able to combat domestic terrorism, particularly white supremacy uh, terrorism, which has been identified as the most significant threat to our homeland security. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. The no. opinion of the chair, the noes have it. I would request a roll call. Roll call has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Oh, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy? No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon? Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose? Ms. Ledger Fernandez? Aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Three yeas, nine nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Any additional amendments? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman I have lady from New Mexico is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee make an order amendment number 35 to H.R. 140 offered by Representative Raskin, which would add an explicit exemption for exception for federal employee action to prevent insurrectionary attacks on the U.S. Capitol and associated threats to members of Congress, congressional staff, U.S. Capitol police officers, and other employees. Uh, as uh, re uh, Representative Raskin, uh, Ms. Scandal and I sat through many a hearing in House administration where we heard about the, the many um, threats that were evidenced within social media, and I think it is, is in essential that our Capitol Police and that our officers are able to respond to those, and that's, uh, I think, the reason behind this amendment. Is there any further discussion of the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, no. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment's not agreed to. <laughs> a roll call has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Oh, Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Yeah. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. Yeah. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. Yeah. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. Yeah. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. Yeah. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Three yeas, nine nays. 
Amendments not agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Hearing no requests for further amendments, the question's on the motion to report. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. We ask for roll call. Roll call has been requested. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. That's aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey, aye. Mr. Norman. Aye. Mr. Norman, aye. Mr. Roy. Aye. Mr. Roy, aye. Mrs. Houchin. Aye. Mrs. Houchin, aye. Mr. Langworthy. Aye. Mr. Langworthy, aye. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Nagoose. Ms. Leisure Fernandez. No. Ms. Leisure Fernandez, no. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk will report the total. Nine nays, three, or nine yeas, three nays. The ayes have it. The motion to report is agreed to. Accordingly, Mr. Manny will be, uh, Massey will be managing the rule for sure. the majority. And I'll do it for the Democrats. I'll uh, tune in for that one, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that, I keep on taking the we're adjourned. Thank everybody for their patience. <laughs> I appreciate it.